sort of push-pull start that could lead us with a stickier type of inflation that I do not hear people talking about. It's always relative, but I think, relatively speaking, people are way more nervous about the U.S. economy than they are Europe at the moment. So Badra Japra over at SOCGEN put out some research yesterday evening and said this. The rise in initial jobless claims, the downside surprise on Philly Fed, they were catalysts for the rally in bonds yesterday. We all witnessed that. Yields lower bonds up. Investors are on edge in our view, seemingly waiting for the next shoe to drop. They're neutral on rates, but they say this. Risk remains skewed to the downside on interest rates. So I keep going back to the range. Pre-SVB highs, post-SVB lows on the two-year. Pre-SVB highs, north to 5%. Post-SVB lows, in and around 350. And the two-year, somewhere in between right now. The bias, if you ask a lot of people in fixed income at the moment, seems to be still towards lower yields again, that we can't challenge those highs pre-SVB. The bias is that what we're seeing with respect to credit tightening, which we cannot gauge out, is really significant. That is the implication, that it will end up bringing down inflation quite substantially. I'm curious if Alan Ruskin would agree with that, because his view is that perhaps inflation is stickier for a bit longer, and it seems like that narrative has been cast aside for the moment. Inflation at Tesla up next. Price cuts <laughs> yesterday. Price hikes this morning. Tesla got hammered in yesterday's session. Year to date, still doing better than good. Dan Ives of Wedbush on Tesla coming up next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, complaints by government workers have brought down Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's close ally. Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab resigned after an independent investigation criticized his treatment of civil servants. The probe into accusations of bullying lasted months, and it threatened to undermine Sunak's pledge to restore professionalism to the government. The U.S. wants to cut its dependence on Taiwan's microchips because of concerns that China might invade the island. Now Taiwanese officials are quietly urging their American counterparts to tone down the rhetoric. They're worried that U.S. comments are harming their business interests. President Biden may formally launch his re-election campaign as early as next week. The president's aides have planned for the possibility of making a video announcement to coincide with the anniversary of his previous campaign launch. He has been signaling that he intends to seek a second term next year, making it somewhat of an open secret. In Canada, police are investigating an airport heist that may have resulted in thieves getting away with millions of dollars worth of gold and other valuables. It took place at Toronto's International Airport, the country's busiest. Now, police say a container with more than $14 million in gold and other items was taken from an airport holding area. And Glencore says that it's on course for yet another bumper year of trading commodities. Energy products continue to be strong first quarter performance while its trading business is booming. Glencore is also trying to expand its mining operations. It's in the middle of a fight to buy Canadian mining rival Tech Resources. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. the first, you know, call it 18 years at Chipotle, this was, you come into Chipotle along the line, you interact with the crew, and you customize your meal. We've got this separate make line, and it's digitized, and so the orders come in, and they're, they're really kind of staged so that if you say at noon, I want to come in at 1 o'clock, we hold that order, and we will send it to the crew like maybe 10 to 1, right. so it's ready right when you pull up your car. How do you manage these kind of two different staffing needs, right? Yes. And making sure you have the right amount of people yes. at, the, at the right right time. We spend a lot of time uh, projecting sales. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, it's part art, part science. We're trying to bring more science and more AI into it. Because yeah. if you get the right sales projection, then you know exactly what your, sale, what your staffing needs to be. So if you get the sales right, you can get the entire restaurant staffed perfectly with just a couple people. Our, our average restaurant now does about um, over a million dollars per restaurant in digital sales. A lot's happening on Wall Street. I'm quite encouraged. The center is holding. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. 
We've got the information and insight. A lot of these areas still have very, very good valuations. From businesses most influential and instrumental. It's knocking it out of the ballpark. Now's not a great time to be speculative. It's time for a pivot. We're talking about a significant hit to our standard of living. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live tonight with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. policy will need to move somewhat further into restricted territory this year with fed funds rate moving above five percent and the real fed funds rate staying in positive territory for some time the fed has been focused on lowering inflation which is absolutely essential if we want to support a growing economy and rising incomes lisa mentioned this a few times already in the last hour the Fed speed yesterday sounding very, very similar. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, Federal Governor, Federal Reserve Governor Michelle Bowman there, weighing in on all of this and sounding pretty much the same, Bramo, that we're going to go one and then we might be done. And that's clear as mud in terms of the trajectory at thereafter. And that's the issue, right? So let's say they finish uh, where they end at May, 20, uh, May 3rd when they hike rates by 25 basis points. That's the expectation. How quickly do they cut? What is the threshold for them to actually make a move lower? Mohammed's range of outcomes. Do you remember them? The three scenarios. Mm -hmm. You pause or you pause, or you pause and then you have to cut, or you pause and then you have to hike. Adam Ruskin, I think, put a little bit of doubt around that story that maybe it's just pause and pause and the May hike's the last hike. He's alone. I do not hear a lot of people talking about that. And to me, it's a compelling point, especially because of what we're seeing in terms of the stop-start economy. Is there enough fear on the Fed that that's a possibility, or have they discounted that fear with some of the incoming softer than expected inflation data? I mentioned a little bit earlier, about 10 minutes ago, that people that come on this program seem to be far more nervous about the US economy right now than they are the European economy. Ken Vexler, an old friend of mine in London, fantastic voice in foreign exchange, for a number of years said this, if you think of it in terms of potential central bank policy mistakes, then surely the risk is skewed to Europe rather than the United States. States. That's an interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? Well, yes, and I think that a lot of people are trying to game this out. This has been narrative roulette. What do people call it? Narrative table tennis, yeah, table I think, tennis. was the, the phrase that it's exhausting. James Athey of Aberdeen used. You know, it's been, that's why I think that the trading range has been sort of interesting and nudgy in its lack of direction because people aren't sure what to make of the next narrative at play. Well, let's talk about Tesla and the next narrative around this name. So yesterday, price cuts again. This morning, Price hikes, specific ones. They've increased prices of their Model S and X and those vehicles in the United States after the steep markdowns that we've seen through the whole year so far. Yesterday, the stock got absolutely hammered. This morning, the stock looks like this, positive by about a half of 1%. Dan Ives, Senior Equity Research Analyst at Wedbush, joins us now to talk about it. Dan, can you help frame the strategy here? Yesterday cuts, this morning hikes. What's happening? Look, they're trying to find the yin-yang, the balance, because I think for right now, it's about a driving demand, but also aggressive because of competition that we're seeing globally. And I think we're going to continue to see this, some cuts, some hikes. I think over the few next few months, you'll start to see it level off. But I think it just speaks to some agita that investors have because of margins. And that's why the stock got crushed yesterday. The sort of flip-flopping, though, of messaging in terms of cutting or raising prices, what do you make of Elon Musk's somewhat, uh, I don't know, uh, random approach in terms of how he's signaling, at least, the pricing? Yeah, Lisa, I think a lot of it is inventory-driven as well as what they're seeing in demand. I think, you know, from month to month, they could tell if ultimately they cut too much or maybe they need to cut more. And I think they're trying to find that balance. Now, when you look at SNX, that's a little different than what's happened with Model Y and 3. I think you're starting to see more of a, a sort of leveling off from a supply demand. Model 3, Model Y, I mean, that's really the focus of the street in terms of how many more price cuts, what margins look like. Because right now, they're kind of going Game of Thrones style in terms of what they're trying to do from a pricing perspective. That's great for demand from a unit perspective, but obviously margins 
that continues to be the elephant in the room. We were speaking with Julian Emanuel yesterday, and he said that Tesla is not just an idiosyncratic story, that it is a macro story, as John was mentioning earlier, because it does signal this need to cut prices and a disinflationary force. How much are you expecting to see that as a theme bleeding through some of the tech earnings that we start getting next week? Look, I do think it is a little separate from what we're going to see next week. I and mean, maybe even if I go back to the next call a few weeks, I mean, Apple, we see iPhone demand that continues to be pretty resilient in the storm. I think cloud, when you look at Microsoft, what we're going to see out of Amazon, Google, and others, I think slight beats. Look, I think overall we're starting to see some stabilization relative to what we saw in December and January, at least from an enterprise spend. I think in terms of tech stocks, in terms of going to earnings, it's a green light to continue to own tech. I think this earnings season is something I think more investors are ultimately going to start to then dive back into tech rather than you know, fearing it in terms of what I believe are fundamentals starting to stabilize. But Dan, dive back in. Talk to me about year to date. What do you think people have been doing already? They've ripped. No, no, no doubt. But I think from an institutional perspective, still many hate the rally. Many, I think, on the sidelines, ultimately sort of betting against tech, and I, which is our view, you know, we can see tech stocks up another 10% plus for the rest of the year because you look what's happened in terms of numbers that are starting to stabilize. They already ripped the Band-Aid off on guidance. And I think big tech, specifically when I look at FANG names, I look at names like Apple, Google, Amazon, and I think these are stocks that could be up 15 20% for the rest of the year. You know, led by Apple. Well, you mentioned the cloud story. Can we just build on that a little bit more? There was obviously massive pull forward in demand for a range of things across this whole spectrum through the pandemic. Dan, I just wonder how much the cloud story has become much more of a cyclical issue now for some of these companies. What's your view on that, Dan? Well, I think we'll see with Microsoft, you know, with what comes out of Redmond on Tuesday. I think the big issue is that a lot of companies, you know, budgets were not set. But they're in the they're halfway through massive cloud deployments. So now you're starting to see more and more. Only 45% of workloads are in the cloud. So that I believe goes to 70% next two years. And I think that's why names like Microsoft continue to sort of see shared gains versus the likes of Amazon. And I think Google's another one that continues to see success. But I think ultimately, I mean, these are rock and Gibraltar sectors in terms of what I see in cloud, cybersecurity, which is why we're bullish going into earnings. What about disappointments? We were speaking earlier with Luke Kawa, and he said that if there is some kind of earnings disappointment, it will be punished disproportionately because his sense is people are waiting for the cash behemoths to continue to be cash behemoths. Do you agree? Oh, no doubt. And also, never underestimate just how bad a management team could be or overestimate how good. That's why you have tacticians like Cook and Nadella and others on one side, but you're going to see, especially in Smith Kaplan, I mean, the, it's almost a fork in the road where you're going to see weak hands play out. I think there is still some froth. And I think, you know, this is ultimately really going to be, I think, a defining earnings season for winners and losers. But I but Lisa, I almost view it as a stock picker's market, which is why you know, I really enjoyed this year in terms of just the way tech's playing out, uh, you know, especially as we go into earnings season. Dan, you got Lisa excited. There was a glimmer of bearishness there. Can you build on that? <laughs> what are you bearish about, Dan? Oh, it's not. I'm. What I'm saying is, this is not a roses and rainbow and champagne macro. So ultimately, you're going to see weak hands fall by the wayside. Competition is going to continue to increase. But ultimately, that's why I think you got to pick the right stocks. It's not necessarily a basket approach. And I think that's what we're going to see play out continue during earnings season. But I think when it comes to large cap tech, when it comes to high quality tech, cybersecurity, cloud. I just continue to view that as a green light going into earnings. Okay. Dan Ives at Wedbush. Dan, no doubt we'll touch base over the next couple Thanks of weeks when we get those earnings. Thank you, sir. Amazon, Microsoft, Google, I think all next week. And then after that, I think Apple early May, right? Yep. In a couple of weeks' time. Yep, correct. And I was looking through it. You know, the bifurcation between also uh, some of the social media stocks and the others, I wonder how much China gets mentioned in some of these, whether, you know, you hear Meta come out and say, well, you know, we're doing okay, but listen, when TikTok goes under or when TikTok has to be sold, we are going to crush it. I mean, how much is that going to be sort of the underpinning of some of the uh, discussion? The stock is up close to 80%.
It's up 77% year to date, Meta. The year of efficiency, is it? Yeah. For Mark Zuckerberg. How much is it the year of potential competitive advantage because of geopolitical issues? I mean, seriously, because you saw a huge uh, pop, not only with Meta, but also in Snap. That said, we did see results from Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, and it was disappointing. And that is one of the main chip makers for Apple goods. So where's the signal in terms of some of these uh, chip makers that have not seen necessarily the dark clouds fully roll away? So you mentioned China. There is going to be a conversation, I believe, based on recent reporting, that the president's going to announce something about curbing investment in China. So Anne-Marie's going to join us in about 25 minutes from now to discuss that. Also, exclusive reporting here at Bloomberg, the president may announce his re-election run officially been waiting for this one, haven't we, for a, a couple of months? Yes, I mean... Didn't Ron Klain say after the holidays? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look, we've been waiting for this. It's April. Why now? What's the tenor of it going to be? Is this because the former President Trump is ramping up his advertising campaign, as maybe. you can see? Well, maybe Klain was right. I just thought, and we just thought he meant Christmas, and he meant Easter. After. <laughs> <laughs> no one knew. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. It's coming, apparently. Mm -hmm. Maybe, as mm -hmm. soon as next week. AMH. 20 minutes away. We'll also catch up with Priya Misra of TD up next. Equity futures down about two tenths of 1% from New York. This is Bloomberg. Business Week Radio, live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, are you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed yeah. does potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. go wrong and smoothing out bumps in the road is what customers expect from energy providers. And for Duke's renewable assets, that process is overseen from one room in an office building in Charlotte, North Carolina. Brian Savoy showed me around the company's renewable control center. This is where our operators um, are monitoring and managing over 5,000 megawatts of renewables across the United States. How would this differ from like a conventional asset monitoring center? Yeah, so assets, uh, historically, mm -hmm. they would have the monitoring center on site. So okay. you might have an operator with screens, but at the site. Whereas this, we could do 90 sites. There's offshore wind, onshore wind, uh, solar, and they're looking for the smallest change in output because mm -hmm. every megawatt hour is money. When one of these assets isn't producing full capacity, we're putting another resource on and we're having to toggle this mm -hmm. on a consistent basis. And, and this, as clouds come, it's this is by the minute. This is not, uh, oh, the hour it's off. No, it's by the minute. And then it'll, it'll fall, come back. And we have assets that follow this um, digitally as well so that we can keep a consistent flow of electrons on the grid. covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. In a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. Welcome to the world of decentralized finance. You can see the massive gains for the OG crypto coin. The breakout we have all perhaps long awaited finally realized. We'll see if it sticks. Bloomberg's covering all things crypto. The people. There's no question this industry is composed of some bad actors and some good actors. The transactions. Volumes have surpassed $24 billion per day. And the technology. Stop talking about the technology. Start demonstrating the utility. Bloomberg Crypto, Tuesdays. The 
this is a frustrating market for both bulls and bears. We're still dealing with the echoes of the crisis, which are going to slow the economy, hit the banking sector, and make the recession even more likely as the year ticks forward. We haven't really seen U.S. growth deteriorate that much yet. I think there's still a lot of lingering concerns over credit tightening. We have to keep in mind that tightening access to credit and tightening financial conditions is exactly what the Fed has been trying to do. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures down by about two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. Over the last couple of days on the S&P, we've gone without gains on the S&P 500. Will we make that day three? For the Federal Reserve, they are one day away from a quiet period. Zip it. No more talking at all until the next Fed meeting, which is on May 2nd, May 3rd. That decision expected to be an interest rate hike. After that, the guidance is pretty clear. President Bostick, let the restrictive action work its way through. President Harker, let monetary policy do its work. We're going to hear so much more of this over the next few weeks, aren't we? It's all fancy ways of saying we're going to pause, right? We're going to hike one more time, and then we're going to stay there. And we're going to stay there for a while, and we're going to see what happens. And people basically take that as, all right, that means you're going to cut rates, and basically it's over. And, I, and how do they push back against that with signaling that they are more patient, that to your point, they still view the risks of inflation as significant despite some signs of disinflation? So we can just focus on the earnings. Bank earnings early this week, the smaller names, tech coming up next week. Then on to May, you get Apple. Just some of the dates for you if you want to jump them down. May 4th for Apple, Microsoft, April 25th, Google, April 25th, Amazon, April 27th. All of that, Lisa, coming up next week. Which is going to be really important. I do wonder whether we see the same kind of price pressures that we saw for Tesla. Dan Ives saying he doesn't think that that's going to be the case, and yet we have seen some reports in terms of chip makers that are showing some slower demand. Still, uh, that said, how much are there going to be winners and losers? I keep going back to that. You know, Dan Ives saying this is going to be a pivotal earnings season and really determine who is going to get stronger from this period and who is not. And I think that that's what we heard from Lukawa as well. Well, let's talk about winners and losers and talk about Tesla. So Tesla's been cutting prices of vehicles over the last few months, most of this year. I've lost count how many times. I think it was close to four. Let's go with four. Was it four? I think it's four. I don't know. Anyway, the that. effort was <laughs> to cut prices, to increase volume, take market share, sacrifice profitability. Stock got hammered yesterday off the back of some of this. This morning, we get price hikes on two very specific models, the Model S and X vehicles here in the United States. The stock is up by a half of 1%. Who are the winners and the losers of price cuts over at Tesla? Initially, based on the price action, the takeaway for a lot of the Tesla bulls, obviously, but for many other people as well, was that their price cuts are everyone else's problem. Yesterday, did it become Tesla's problem too? Well, how much does Tesla have to be treated like a car manufacturing instead of a moonshot? And that, I think, with valuation, it really uh, hints at a valuation story more than it does its dominance in the electric vehicle uh, industry. You heard from Ford earlier this morning that this is going to become their problem, too, because you could get a race to the bottom, and their margins are a lot smaller than Tesla's margins. But here we are in a scenario where we're questioning valuations. This isn't about necessarily survival or existential angst, and that has to do with Tesla, and that has to do with regional banks, and it has to do more broadly with a lot of market stories. Here's one investor group for you, a Tesla investor group, a coalition of 17 shareholders who hold more than $1.5 billion of Tesla stock. Now compare that to the overall market cap of Tesla, and you can figure out pretty quickly that that's not a great deal of stock that they hold, but it's significant enough that we should have a conversation about it. A group of Tesla investors has accused the company of mismanagement and are seeking a meeting with its board to discuss the performance of the CEO, Elon Musk. There is some concern here, obviously, Lisa, that maybe he is distracted because he's overcommitted across too many companies. He's always been a key man risk. We hear this every earnings season, whether it's him smoking pot on a call with, a, you know, investors or a call uh, online or whether it's him uh, making inroads in a whole host of other companies. His rock star status has always been a point of angst for the company, but also a driving force. At this point, though, how much is he just basically real time trying to price out the market in a way that is perhaps more transparent than some of the other vehicle makers and some of the other manufacturers? This is according to an open letter they sent to the chairwoman and to one director. They want the board to come up with a plan and seek to remove directors too closely tied to the CEO. I don't think these issues are new, are they? No. At all. They've been around for a long, long time. 
This has always been an issue. It perhaps is more pressing because of the number of different companies. I think this is all just, what are you doing? We want to have more clarity on your strategy, and I think a lot of people are hoping for that. The stock is positive 7 tenths of 1%. The broader equity market on the S&P 500 down about a quarter of 1%. If we can just touch base, take a snapshot of the bond market briefly, yields lower by a single basis point. No drama here, Bramo. 352 on a 10-year. We've been getting uh, regional bank earnings throughout the morning, throughout the week, including regionals financial earlier at around 6 a.m. We get H8 Fed data on commercial banking at 4.15 p.m. This will be important. It's sort of the drumbeat to May 8th when we get the senior loan officer survey to get a sense of deposits and loans created. We get 9.45 a.m. in the U.S., the S&P Global Manufacturing and Services PMIs, as well as the composite reading. We got earlier this morning the European read. The composite looked good. Completely different story whether you're looking at services which beat or manufacturing which missed. This has been the story. How long does this continue? And to Alan Ruskin's point of Deutsche Bank, does this mean that inflation is going down faster than people expected or that it's going to be stickier? I mean, really, again, choose your narrative and you can plug in the numbers to basically back it up at this point. 4.35 p.m., the last gasp before quiet. Fed Governor Lisa Cook is speaking at Georgetown University. I'm more curious less about uh, how much they're going to hike rates and much more about what the threshold is for them to start cutting. How high is that bar? How much are they looking for economic weakness? Is it an employment number? Is it something more specific with respect to core inflation getting down to a certain level and having to stay there for a specific period of time, John? The question has certainly shifted away from how far are they going to hike to how far will they cut? Priya Misra joins us now, Head of Global Race Strategy at TD Securities. Priya, let's start with the economic data. It's changed since we last spoke. It started to weaken. That process seems to be continuing. Do you expect it to, to accelerate in the coming months? We do. I mean, the Fed's still hiking. QT is still ongoing. Long and real rates are high. And now you've got the bank uh, tightening lending standards. I guess our view is this is not an idiosyncratic mismanagement of a few banks. This is going to have long-lasting issues. We think deposits continue to fly out of, of banks into money market funds. Um, and so the banks are going to have to cut lending standards. You know, even if you ignore the CRE issue, I think uh, as lending slows down, our view is it's going to accelerate. But it's a really tricky time for the market because because things are slowing, I don't think I can point to any data right now and say, here's the recession. But we think it is going to happen. I think that speed of the uh, of the decline, particularly in high-frequency data, is what we're looking at. Um, in our view, it is going to accelerate into the second half. We see a recession in the fourth quarter. But really, I think you have to be nimble because the data is just slowing. I think it's not obvious right now, but but uh, we do think it's all the signs point towards uh, this accelerating uh, into the end of the year. Priya, I'd love your take on Alan Ruskin's comments with respect to uh, the divergence that we see with respect to manufacturing and services. He says that this is a sign that if the Fed pauses, they may have to hike again later on as some of the distortions from the pandemic era buildup of inventory starts to work itself through. Do you agree that there actually is a risk here signaled by this divergence of inflation that's stickier and remains much higher than, than people expect? So I agree that inflation is likely to be more sticky. We think there are structural factors, demographics, you know, onshoring, et cetera. Um, you know, but I would say uh, manufacturing is a more cyclical industry. Manufacturing typically slows down before services. Services have been strong because the consumers have a saving buffer and monetary policy works with a lag. Our view is manufacturing is actually a harbinger for the fact that services is going to slow down. As that savings buffer comes down and I can't really max out my credit card and I can't get another credit card, I think that's when consumer spending starts to slow down. So our view is that the Fed is going to be torn, really torn between inflation north of 2%, but the unemployment rate starting to rise. I think we don't know their pain threshold. Is it 4%? Is it 4.5%? Is it 5 I think the market's going to grapple with that for the rest of the year. But I actually think that services is going to slow down. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 hiking again, I think that well, we should be talking about that in 2025. I think first they're going to have to cut rates. They're going to have to take rates into accommodative territory, which is not priced in. We're still pricing in a trough rate above 3% on Fed funds. If the economy is in a recession at the end of this year, I think we'll be talking about how low they are going rather than stopping around 3%. Priya, this is pretty incredible at a time when a lot of people don't think the Fed is ever going to go back to the ultra-low rates that we saw pre-pandemic. Are you saying that zero or even half a percent or 1% is very much on the table for a Fed funds rate? So I look at real rates. I think real rates should probably be closer to zero or negative. You know, if inflation is going to be 3% next year or 
heaven forbid, 4% next year, you know, then how low can the Fed go in terms of nominal rates? Perhaps two, one. You know, but I do think if the uh, if the unemployment rate is rising, we see it peaking at five and a half next year. It's very similar to what happened after the savings and loan crisis. If you get that much weakening in the labor market, the Fed has to take real rates negative. So I don't know about zero or QE, but can they get to 2% on Fed funds? I think that would be our base case, two, two and a half, at least get rates that low. And the market's not pricing that in. So I think we should keep an eye on inflation clearly, but those real rates. And real rates right now are well in restrictive territory. I think that's what we'll be watching, how much the Fed cuts. But right now they're in a bind. I don't think they can signal any near-term cuts. So our view is that they start later in terms of rate cuts. They're going to be pulled in, as we call it, kicking and screaming into rate cuts. But when they start that cutting, they're going to be much more aggressive than the market's pricing in. Priya, just awesome to get your perspective as always. Priya Misra there of TD Securities Thanks. looking for 5.5% unemployment next year. Next year, 5.5% unemployment in America. The Federal Reserve's at 46 in 2024, they're at 4.6 on unemployment in 2025. Matt Lazzetti at Deutsche Bank talked about this a little bit earlier this week, and he said the bank struggles to forecast unemployment as too high because it implies they might be doing something wrong, and also went as far as saying it could be self-fulfilling and could lead to something bad. You basically said they don't have the luxury of saying what they think is going to happen just objectively as passive participants because they are active, and they're actually uh, having to control the message a bit in order to signal a certain degree of confidence or a certain uh, degree of steadiness that they want the market to follow, which again, it goes to the point that you made, which is sort of the George Soros type of, uh, of self-fulfilling prophecy. But this really is the bind for the Federal Reserve that is trying to signal something, but also retain its credibility from an economics perspective at a time when the message they're sending is somewhat bitter. They can shape the events they anticipate Correct. to some degree, to some extent. Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro is going to join us a little bit later on this morning. Look out for that conversation. To Neil's point, there's no in-between here. Either the Fed stays where they are or they're going to cut way more than you think they're going to cut. Coming up next, we're going to catch up with Anne-Marie Hordern down in Washington, D.C. The latest from Jordan Fabian, Mario Parker and Josh Wingrove down in Washington. President Biden looking at formally launching his re-election campaign as early as next week. That conversation up next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's deputy, Dominic Raab, has quit after an investigation into bullying complaints. The probe criticized Raab's behavior toward civil servants. It's a major blow to Sunak. He's tried to present his government as a contrast to the Boris Johnson era, which was marked by political scandals. Federal Reserve officials are backing another interest rate increase. At the same time, they're monitoring the economic fallout from stresses on the banking system. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester says she favors getting rates above 5% because inflation is still too high. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic says he backs a one-and-done rate hike approach. President Biden will crack down on U.S. investment in key parts of China's economy. Bloomberg's learned he'll sign an executive order in the coming weeks that will limit investing in Chinese semiconductors, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. The president's hoping to get the backing of its G7 partners. And Elon Musk is doing an about-face. After saying he would continue to drop the price of his EVs, Tesla is now increasing the cost of its Model S and X vehicles in the U.S. Prices for the high-end models will be bumped up by $2,500, raising the cost of the sedan and SUV by 2% to 3%. Steep markdowns earlier this year took a toll on profitability and Tesla shares. Global news powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
welcome to the world of decentralized finance. You can see the massive gains for the OG crypto coin. The breakout we have all perhaps long awaited finally realized. We'll see if it sticks. Bloomberg's covering all things crypto, the people. There's no question this industry is composed of some bad actors and some good actors. The transactions. Volumes have surpassed $24 billion per day. And the technology. Stop talking about the technology. Start demonstrating the utility. Bloomberg Crypto, Tuesdays. From New York City, from London, in Sydney, from Washington, in Tokyo. 9 a.m. in Beijing and Shanghai. Good morning, everyone. Have a great evening. Here's what I'm watching. You do not want to miss this Is story. there the kind of upside? season is here. We haven't had a shocker yet. They are minting money. The markets are still volatile. I think it's going to be choppy. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. First quarter results, impressive. The revenue beat is amazing. With exclusive expert analysis. This is really important to watch. Buy on the fear, sell on the news. Where is the upside in this market? Do we get answers to that today? The bottom line speaks for itself, and that's what moves markets. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. National security is of paramount importance in our relationship with China. Even though these policies may have economic impacts, they are driven by straightforward national security considerations. And we will not compromise on these concerns, even when they force trade-offs with our economic interests. A landmark speech from the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on the relationship between the United States and China. National security concerns trumping economic interests. The latest today from Jenny Leonard, our colleague down in Washington. President Biden aiming to sign an executive order in the coming weeks that will limit investment in key parts of China's economy by American businesses. We'll pick up on that story in Washington in just a moment. The broader price action this morning looks like this. We're down two-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Softer this morning, just a touch softer through the week. No real drama. A couple of days without gains on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields not doing much on a 10-year 353. In the FX market, pretty much unchanged as well. A bit of a snooze going into the weekend so far. 109.72 on the euro against the US dollar. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say down in Washington, our Washington correspondent, Anne-Marie, joins us. AMH, I want to start with this, the report from our colleagues that maybe next week is the week where the president announces officially that he's running. Well, the president had said in Ireland that relatively soon he'll be making that announcement. And we've seen everyone in his inner circle, and most importantly, including the first lady, Dr. Joe Biden, come out and said, of course, he is running. But he's making this announcement potentially next week. Nothing is set in stone in a video that would be released. So potentially this is also even a soft launch because it is, doesn't seem like it's going to be a massive, huge campaign event if this is just a video with the president saying once again he is running and his intent is to run. But he will start also taking meetings with donors. So it does look like they are trying to set the scene. There's been a lot of debate about whether or not he should, get, should announce for 2024 officially as soon or put it off because he is the president of the United States. And once he announces, he becomes not just President Joe Biden, but also n potential nominee for 2024. And what, then he's a candidate. But what's the calculus here, Anne Marie? Why does it matter in terms of exactly when he decides to run and what that could signal? So some of the calculus, of course, they want to be able to set up these donor meetings and make sure they can get campaign staffing in place, um, make sure they're going to have a campaign manager. And it does seem like he probably is under some pressure within the Democratic Party because obviously those whispers are, are still circulating about whether or not this should be the individual to lead them into the future. Remember, at 80 years old right now, he is the oldest U.S. president, and if he takes, a, takes the U.S., uh, Democratic Party into 2024, he will be 86 at the end of that term. So obviously his age has been a big concern, um, and they're probably under some pressure to, you know, make that decision and and start looking at it as the Republican race is uh, for who's going to be their candidate is clearly heating up. And Marie, the, as he talks about this, he's clinging on to the bipartisan agreed upon uh, kind of talking point of how to deal with China right now. And we heard that uh, the Biden administration is planning to unleash some provisions about restrictions on U.S. investment in China. Do we have any sense of what those might look like and whether it's currently being expected by people in the market? 
We don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but it will probably start targeting those uh, investments into companies or technologies that can advance Chinese military. The same way you're seeing advanced technologies that the U.S. curb in terms of the export controls. One thing this administration has really tried to do is make sure they can gain the support of allies as they try to confront China on this economic basis, which is why you see potentially this is going to be a huge story at the G7, which Biden will be attending in Hiroshima in Japan. He wants to make sure other countries are looking at similar ways to curb investment into China, so they're not going at it alone. But we still are waiting for some details on this, but obviously it comes at a time when tensions continue to ratchet between Beijing and Washington, and so much of this has to do with what's going on in Taiwan. Well, never mind tensions between Beijing and Washington. Let's talk about Paris and Washington. When you go to that G7, what's the president say to the French leader about this push? Well, they had a phone call yesterday, and a readout came that they obviously talked about China and uh, maintaining a safe and independent Taiwan Strait. Uh, for me, reading the tea leaves, this phone call potentially was maybe a talking to to President Emmanuel Macron to make sure they are on the same page. What you've seen French officials do is really try to walk back and tone down some of that rhetoric we heard from Emmanuel Macron. But it's going to be uh, slightly awkward because he obviously said these things. He talked about Europe not becoming a vassal between U.S. and China. He talked about strategic autonomy, talked about not wanting to decouple from China. Uh, the issue Emmanuel Macron has, though, is that he doesn't have the backing of his European allies on this. Um, many European leaders and officials were uncomfortable with the comments Macron has made, not just those in the United States. Wasn't there a diplomatic spat very early on in the administration under President Biden <laughs> over submarines and some tension between the French and the United States back then as well? Well, potentially this is something that the Australians maybe saw and underscores the reason why they ditched France for the partners they uh, took on in the end for these nuclear submarines, which is the United Kingdom, the United States, and that deal is called AUKUS. We recently saw Prime Minister Albanese, as well as Rishi Sunak, alongside the president in California, talking about these submarines. Um, and yes, there's been a few spats between Paris and Washington throughout this administration, um, but this is a, a little bit also of how Emmanuel Macron likes to have his diplomacy, right? We saw him um, go speak to Putin a number of times when others were a bit concerned that he wasn't going to be able to make a breakthrough. He's almost trying to do the same thing with Xi Jinping. A big part of his trip was try to get China on board to really work out a peace agreement, putting pressure on Moscow. Um, but for Xi Jinping, this was a huge coup. Emmanuel Macron's trip was a huge coup, and it also put Ursula von der Leyen, who was there with him, in a very difficult position. Yeah, I have to say, I forgot she was even there, Anne-Marie. Yeah. Did, did anything come out from her side whatsoever? Uh, really, everything was overshadowed by Emmanuel Macron. That is what the Chinese government wanted to push forward, and then, obviously, <laughs> it wasn't just the trip, but the interview he gave to French journalists and Politico on his way back uh, that created really even more tension and drama. MH, thank you. Wonderful to get some clarity from you down in Washington. Tune in to Balance of Power for more clarity a little bit later on this evening, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. AMH, Joe Matthew, speaking to Kay Bailey Hutchinson, the former U.S. ambassador to NATO. No doubt some of these issues are going to come up. Some of these leaders, Bramo, they love playing the statesman, don't they? They're desperate for it. Macron's one, Trudeau's another. You know, those kind of personalities that just want to be seen on the international stage saying big things. Right, exactly, like deal maker and just sort of, you know, bringing together the powers while, while their their world burns. I mean, this is sort of the, the, the sort of uh, theory and, and the pushback that Emmanuel Macron got. I think it's interesting, though, that we did not get anything from Ursula von der Leyen that was memorable. I forgot she was there. Exactly. I think that's actually really telling at a time when even Germany, yes, they acknowledge the potential risk from China. That economy cannot decouple right now from China. If you look at their auto manufacturers, they are entirely reliant and purchases in China. That is pretty much consistent across the board. How much is that what's underpinning the strength that we're seeing in Europe? And so how much is Emmanuel Macron saying the quiet part out loud? Well, never mind German autos. 
French luxury. Yeah. Now okay. VMH. Exactly. Can now VMH decouple from China? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I don't think so. Which is, again, the quiet part out loud. How much is Emmanuel Macron actually representing what a lot of companies feel, not only in Europe, yes. but also in the US? I have this issue with Russia. Do you remember the lead up to the war? The Italian business lobby, do you remember that? They were still holding meetings yeah. and, yeah. You know, business in Europe wanted to keep those ties, and I imagine they're going to want to keep those ties with China regardless of what happens. Which is why I think it'll be interesting to see what actually we get from the Biden administration in terms of curbs, what the meat is behind Janet Yellen saying that national security comes before economic interest. Dan Suzuki of Richard Bernstein is going to join us next. Looking forward to that conversation. He's pushed back against this rally in the tech sector. He thinks it's time for a change of leadership. We're going to have that conversation in just a moment. Your equity market, negative two-tenths of 1%. This is Bloomberg. ideas we show the productivity increases that are possible uh, because of artificial intelligence it's these companies who could be some of the biggest uh, beneficiaries if they harness AI correctly I think a lot of people are looking for the killer app like they they look like these uh, viral apps that the internet delivered the killer app for artificial intelligence is productivity gains and any company does not harness it uh, is probably not going to be one of the big winners out there. And just one other thing on AI. The real winners here are going to be those companies that have proprietary data and have lots of it, have the best domain expertise, best AI expertise, and the best pools of high quality data to basically create new businesses. ask me all the time, what is the key to being a really good investor? I tell them it's to surround yourself with and work with the best investors you can find. On Bloomberg Wealth, I'm going to take you to meet the greatest investors in the world, the people that I would like to have managing my money. While I like home runs and grand slams in baseball, at A-Rod Corp here, we shoot for singles and doubles, and we definitely never want to strike out. He's negative here on the S&P 500, down 0.2% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down four-tenths of 1%. Softer here in the equity market. In the bond market, we look a little something like this on a two-year. 
your yield north of 4% through all of this week, 4.12% right now, down a couple of basis points on a two-year, down a lot more just yesterday off the bank of softer than anticipated data. Jobless claims a little bit higher, fully fed, not looking too decent. And the Fed just encouraging one more hike and then saying pause. We're done through the rest of this year. That was overwhelmingly the consensus view from the Fed officials we heard from yesterday, and I think we heard from at least six of them in just 24 hours. They go into the quiet period tomorrow, so no more Fed speak until the Fed decision on May 3rd, then on to the ECB on May 4th. So let's get to the euro. The euro backing away from 110.76 this time last week to 109.73 this morning. Totally unchanged. Lisa, some snoozy price action to close out the week. Yeah. And it's honestly interesting that it's snoozy because there's a lot under the surface, but it really speaks to this lack of conviction that everybody has, and we hear it from everybody who comes on the show. If you want to look for conviction, it's in the uh, recession in manufacturing that continues, and that's sort of what I'm focused on. First of all, Tesla, those shares are up a whole half percent after uh, perhaps a bit of an about face by Elon Musk saying that he was going to raise prices on Model S and Model X uh, vehicles in the U.S. after multiple price cuts. The, share, the uh, shares rebounding just a touch, but yesterday they were absolutely pummeled on the idea of yet another price cut, really raising questions about whether we end up in this sort of disinflationary spiral that is more broadly applicable to a wider range of companies. You're seeing that in big lots, perhaps, in Overstock.com. Furniture providers and Piper Sandler put out a note downgrading both of them in light of a lack of demand for home furnishing. I wonder if this is also a specific set of home furnishing, if this continues to be the K-shaped recovery for people who are looking for, you know, sort of a medium and low-income uh, furnishings rather than the highest income, which continues to produce uh, some returns. Overstock down almost 3%, Big Lots down more than 6%. Remember when Overstock had this huge pop on just mentioning crypto assets and mentioning Bitcoin in their release? I mean, you talk about, you know, a complete about-face for some of the names where you see froth being taken out from markets and market narratives at a time when these shares are already down by, I believe, about 30% so far this year. Now it's AI. You just have to put AI in your name. Do you Chat, remember that? I remember Chat that. Was Overstock? it 2017? Yeah. 2017? Late 2017? Something like that, when everyone just started putting crypto okay. things in their names. Yeah, and then every and then their shares would absolutely surge. Long Island Ice Tea, was that one of the names? <laughs> Something like that. Do you remember <laughs> yes. that ticker? I, I mean, there, there were ticker. some ridiculous was, stories. It was insanity. But, and, and, and so now the question is, okay, that's dead, right? And that's not going to really do anything or prop up your share price. You think AI will work? You think you say, like, you know, chat overstock? Oh, yeah. Dot com? Put GBT on the end of anything. Stock goes up, for sure. You mentioned some of the higher-end players. William Sonoma is positive on the year by about 6%. Restoration hardware, though, negative by 8%. The real test, if you go around the corner and go to Design Within Reach, ask them how business is. Because things there cost a fortune. Yes, it's really nice like, stuff, though. I know, but I really just like to look at I know. To look it's at, like, the $5,000 chair. Sit in it. Yeah. Enjoy it for that the if afternoon. you bought, you'd never actually sit in because you'd be too scared of breaking <laughs> you put, it. put, like, plastic on it. I don't know if I'm going to go that far. But I do think that you do see that K-shape recovery. I mean, we talk about Hermes and LVMH, and you talk about uh, William Sonoma doing better. And then some of these others, is that sort of a sign of what we're seeing on the margins for people who have to pay attention to discretionary Are you the kind of person that buys a sofa and put, puts plastic on top of it? <laughs> no, I am you not. Make, you make I'm not from moves. 1946 in okay. Long Island. I'm just asking. Is that what they did in 1946 in Long Island? Plastic <laughs> over sofas? I don't know. We'll ask Tom when he's back. <laughs> ben Suzuki, Deputy CIO at Richard Bernstein Advisors, joins us now to talk about some of the earnings in this equity market. Dan, great to catch up with you, sir. Let's just start with earnings season so far. Early days, you know the arc of it. You start with the financials. You shift the tech next week. What's the takeaway so far for you and the team, Dan? Yeah, obviously, Jonathan, it's still very early in earnings season. But so far, I think the takeaway is very clear. That growth continues to slow, uh, and that continues to pressure prospects profits and put us further into this earnings recession that we've already been in. I think that's the big takeaway. Nothing's collapsing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of fears of, you know, the, the, the carryover from the banking crisis and things were going to fall apart. That's not the case, but things continue to get worse. And from an operating leverage perspective, you know, that benefit that helped companies over the last couple of years is now really starting to bite. And we're starting to see them cut costs. Meta going through the year of efficiency, so to speak, making cuts. The stock is up by 77%. We've talked about this before, Dan. I know it's a subject you're focused on. Can they cut costs quick enough? 
No, I don't think so, uh, Jonathan. And, and I think that's uh, very evident in the data. Uh, you know, you look at these companies, you know, the, when have you seen companies proactively cut their workforce, you know, to keep up with falling top line growth uh, such that their margins are expanding? You know, that's the hope here. Uh, but that's rarely the case. If growth continues to slow, I think that's going to continue to hurt them more uh, than they can than they can make it up make up for uh, on the operating line. So we're talking about tech as a sort of holistic group. And Dan Ives earlier this morning was talking about how this is going to be a defining earnings season of winners and losers, a consolidation of market share and power, and you'll see that reflected in the shares. Do you disagree? Well, I think to some extent, you know, that's absolutely right. I mean, look at think about the the word tech. Uh, it, it kind of is kind of less and less meaningful at this point. You know, from an investor sentiment perspective, I think it's very meaningful. But at the end of the day, you know, tech is part of everything now, right? That's why they keep reclassifying, you know, the indices because you know you have to move more to thinking about tech in terms of those end markets, and those end markets do have different demand drivers. So I think you will see, you know, different quarter to quarter, there will be differences in timing. Uh, and the fundamentals. And so there will be opportunities for stock pickers. But I think ultimately, when you look holistically at tech, you know, the reality is that people got so excited about all these companies and they all got, they all benefited, you know, from this, what turned into a bubble. And as that deflates, and as people realize, you know, there's more to the world than wiener dogs in the metaverse, as my boss likes to say, you know, then, then you have to focus on real things and real assets. I could go a lot of places with that, but let's just stick on the tech theme and what we expect from next week, given the fact that we potentially could get some sort of tipping point in terms of sentiment, how these really are such dominant players in the index. Do you think that this will be a make it or break it kind of earnings season, not only for the tech players, but more broadly, if those shares really do sell off? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you if you back into it that way and say if these stocks really sell out, then then I think by definition it's going to be a make or break quarter. But uh, I think you know when I think about it, I think make or break quarter is probably the wrong way to think about it. Uh, you know, I think as you've seen over the last couple quarters, you know, their fundamentals continue to deteriorate. They get further into you know negative earnings growth. Yet you know they've clearly had some rallies along the way, and I think that. Um, you know, it's just it's sort of the the compounding of worse and worse, you know, fundamental data to the point where you just can't justify, you know, the valuations, which for the tech sector are now like 25 times. And, you know, I think at some point, you know, you, you real the market starts to start to come back to reality. But make or break quarters, put, putting a lot of pressure on one print, I think it's going to be the com combination of, you know, their earnings fundamentals combined with what's happening in the macro economy. You put it all together. The timing, you know, doesn't come out to the day, you know, they report earnings. Dan, one theme that I think we need to build on just a little bit more. Some of these names, particularly in tech, were considered defensive through most of the last decade, flattered by where interest rates were, I know. But one of the reasons a lot of people used to say that, Dan, was because they had these secular tailwinds, which were somewhat divorced from the cycle. Dan, do you still see it quite the same way as other people did over the last 10 years? Or are they far more cyclical, more sensitive to the cycle than perhaps some people are letting on? Well, I think if you, if you just, you know, dispassionately look at the data, even over the last decade when they were considered defensive, you know, you look at their earnings sensitivity. If you put COVID aside, you know, where, you know, they, a lot of these companies actually did, you know, benefit from an earnings perspective, you know, as the world was, as the economy was collapsing, you put that aside, almost every single cycle, you know, they've been some of the most, their earnings have been some of the most sensitive, you know, to that cyclicality. So I think that nothing has changed there. We're not saying it's, it's worse or it's better, people just underappreciate, especially since their last example, you know, the recency bias is the pandemic. They are very cyclical companies. I mean, just think, just fundamentally think about it. If we go into a recession, we go into a major slowdown, people will buy, be buying less $100,000 EV cars. People will be buying less, you know, $1,500 to $2,000, you know, phones. People will be buying less streaming services, et cetera, et cetera. That's just a normal cycle. Um, so all, we're not saying anything profound. We're just saying you should expect normal things to occur. Has it been frustrating for you, Dan, that the fundamentals have really borne out a lot of your theses, but the market action hasn't really? Uh, I, I think that's to be expected. I mean, our, our point uh, to investors has been that bubbles don't deflate overnight. If you go back, you know, to the deflation of the Internet bubble, it took two and a half years. And, and along the way, you had so many rallies, you know, 16 different double-digit rallies, two of which were over 50%. 
Uh, I think, you know, that's to be expected. You know, people love these these parts of their portfolios, they dominate their portfolios. You know, they're not going to go out without a fight. And so I think that, you know, the, the, at every opportunity of, of optimism, people are going to rush back into things. And I think that's, that's always been the case. That's what history, you know, has borne out. And so I think, you know, actually looking away for the real opportunities out there that are underappreciated and underlooked, the ones that have underperformed. Granted, they've underperformed for over a decade. You know, those will probably be the bigger opportunities over the coming decade. Hey, Dan, appreciate the update from you, the team, as always. Thank you, sir. Dan Suzuki there of Richard Bernstein Advisors. The call so far this week, it's a process, not an event. Seems to be the trend, doesn't it, whether we're talking about this, tech stocks, or the financials and what's going to happen with financial conditions. Markets don't like processes. No, they want it all at once on Correct. TV. Special program. Exactly. If they want it Sunday night One special. One special. Exactly. Let's go. And just to tell Price us what we can all expect. At once. <laughs> and it's just not going to be delivered that way. So how do you remain patient when you could tell a fundamental story that's borne out by facts and yet... It's not reflected in the market action. It's, you know, the reason why we've got this sort of malaise setting in of just oh, range bound. You nailed it, though, Lisa. The most frustrating thing, and Dan played it down, it's so frustrating to nail the macro call and then get the market call wrong. Luke Carra was talking to us from UBS a little bit earlier this morning, and that's the conversation I had with him. Fantastic call from the team at the start of the year over at UBS. And then tech's just ripped. And, and the tech ripping part of it just wasn't a feature of the overall call. This is the reason why this is such a difficult market, because every time you try to look at the fundamentals and come up with a story, you know, you get, I don't know, in Wall Street parlance, your face ripped off. I mean, it just is a very difficult uh, moment. And, and I think that that's really what the Fed is facing as well. And so people who are looking to the Fed for guidance have gotten frustrated with the lack thereof. And now we have from Andrew Hollenhorst that they're now just going to be wordlessly watching. I saw that. I love I that phrase. That. I actually really enjoy that. He said that they're going to be upgrading growth and inflation forecasts in the June projections. Do you see that line? Yep. Well, That's I mean, this, what he expects from the Fed. Andrew Hollenhorst has been really consistent with uh, expecting rates to be a lot higher than a lot of people think and expressing that inflationary inputs are bigger than many expect. Hollenhorst, the city, looking for hikes in May, June, and July. By the way, I'm so pleased that Dan Suzuki said what he said about the pandemic. That was not a cyclical test for those tech companies. Just wasn't. Quite the opposite. Have these tech companies in their current form ever had a cyclical test? That's a different kind of conversation. Neil Dutter of Renmac. Now, he has been constructive on this economy in a way that other people have not. An update from Neil in the next hour. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, complaints by government workers have brought down Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's close ally. Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab resigned after an independent investigation criticized his treatment of civil servants. The probe into accusations of bullying lasted months, and it threatened to undermine Sunak's pledge to restore professionalism in the government. The U.S. wants to cut its dependence on Taiwan's microchips because of concerns that China might invade the island. Now Taiwanese officials are quietly urging their American counterparts to turn down the rhetoric. They are worried that U.S. comments are harming their business interests. President Biden may formally launch his re-election campaign as early as next week. The president's aides have planned for the possibility of making a video announcement to coincide with the anniversary of his previous campaign launch. He's been signaling that he intends to seek a second term next year, making it somewhat of an open secret. In the UK, two insurers have become the first major companies to quit the Confederation of British Industry. That follows a report involving allegations of a second case of rape at the business lobbying group. Aviva and Phoenix Group have canceled their memberships. Aviva says the CBI is no longer able to represent corporate Britain. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Steve's ability on the course may not be etched into any record books, but no, following him around... No. It's clear that it's not for lack of trying. Jeez. We were constantly hustling behind him as he caught up with executives in the portfolio companies and reminisced with former and current players. He was a day trader. He taught himself self-made self day traders. Yeah. And so he's on the bus 
after a game in New England, and he's day trading on the bus, and Bill Belichick sees him and cuts him on the spot. Yeah, in many ways, it's a convention, right, of the people that I don't see maybe once a year, and so it's kind of all come together. My firm, our charity, our fundraising efforts, and then the friends that are around. My dad and my brother, it all happens right there as a confluence of all these parts of my life that have found its common center. Lots happening on Wall Street. I'm quite encouraged. The center is holding. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. A lot of these areas still have very, very good valuations. From businesses most influential and instrumental. It's knocking it out of the ballpark. Now's not a great time to be speculative. It's time for a pivot. We're talking about a significant hit to our standard of living. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live tonight with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Next. It was going to keep Ray World Cup. This is a three. As the economic picture done. Is it the okay is getting ready to make this? Why do the biggest names in business choose Bloomberg? That is a great question. It's a great question. Great question. Great question. Best question I get all night. Bloomberg. Top experts. Great questions. States will assert ourselves when our vital interests are at stake, but we do not seek to decouple our economy from China's. A full separation of our economies would be disastrous for both countries. It would be destabilizing for the rest of the world. Janet Yellen there, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, offering her view in a landmark speech of the relationship between the United States and China. From New York City, welcome to the program and good morning to you. Your equity market looks a little something like this on the S&P 500. We are negative by 0.2% on the S&P. Yields are doing absolutely nothing. The euro as well. The 10-year yield, 352.99. Unchanged there on a 10-year yield. Euro dollar, the euro against the US dollar, firmer by a tenth of 1% on that currency pair. So a bit of dollar strength, or rather a bit of euro strength, some dollar weakness. Euro dollar backing away from the levels of last Friday, though. This time last Friday, 110.76, a new intraday high for the year on the single currency. Just sub 110 through much of this week on the euro, particularly this morning. And a current joins us now from Washington, D.C., the Bloomberg Global Economy correspondent, now based in Washington, with the expertise on China, as always, they remain. And just let's talk about that. We heard from the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, framing what she thinks the relationship should be between the United States and China, and pointing out quite emphatically that, yes, there should be no decoupling, but ultimately, security concerns are paramount. Now, Andrew, I wonder how the Chinese government has responded to the comments from the Treasury Secretary just yesterday. Well, it sounds like they weren't accepting Janet Yellen's message. John, I look at some of the comments that came out of Beijing overnight. The spokesperson for the foreign ministry made the point that the U.S. is trying to choke China's economic development. In fact, they said it was economic coercion. And that's interesting because, as you mentioned in the Treasury Secretary's speech yesterday, she seemed to go out of her way to make the point, look, we're willing to take a hit here, an economic hit on national security grounds when it comes to competition with China. But she also stressed it wasn't about trying to contain China. And a lot of people were skeptical, of course, of whether or not that message would be received in Beijing. And obviously, judging by the comments overnight, they're not seeing it that way. They are seeing it as though uh, the US is trying to ring fence China. We had some comments also from the foreign minister as well. He spoke to a, a meeting of top business, Western business executives. And he was also pushing back against some of the criticism towards China, especially around Taiwan, for example. So, you know, there was a there was some interpretation yesterday that Janet Yellen was being hawkish, but also maybe a hint of a middle middle ground, some olive branch uh, in terms of where they can cooperate. But obviously, Beijing is just taking it as route one. And they're saying, look, you're trying to choke our economic development. That wasn't the big surprise to me. We kind of expected them to take it that way. That's been the tit for tat that we keep hearing between the U.S. and China. What's more interesting to me, perhaps, is what the G7 response will be, and that the U.S. is seeking the approval of the G7 leaders to approve some of these curbs on investment in China. What is the response like in the other members of that group, especially after signs of some division uh, on the margins with not only, uh, but most prominently, Emmanuel Macron? Yeah, absolutely, Lisa. It will be really interesting to see what kind of unity 
they do get among the G7 members, like you mentioned. France, obviously, sending mixed signals on where exactly they are when it comes to the sort of alliance that's being built against China at the moment. Uh, China has been very active on the global stage in recent weeks, not just with G7 members, but beyond. We had that, of course, that visit from Brazil's Lula last week, talking about uh, closer alliances there. The point being, and you heard Larry Summers last week making the point that it doesn't seem like everybody is on board the US narrative when it comes to China. So this may be a harder sell than it looks for the US in terms of getting everybody on the same page, the G7 economies in particular on the same page, to agree some of these industrial uh, some of these investment curves. We know some countries are probably uh, well on the way. Japan, for example, has been signaling it's, it's on board for this US approach, but we don't know if everybody's there. And as you mentioned, at the very least, France will certainly probably have some skepticism when it comes to this. As we get into this sort of tit for tat, back and forth, and understanding where we are as the state of play, Sometimes I, I lose the plot when you zoom out and just how much has changed with China's economy and, frankly, its role geopolitically as it really befriends uh, Saudi Arabia, as it really connects uh, more closely with Russia. How, how different is now versus, say, three years ago when it comes to both of those issues? Well, I think, you know, it goes to this idea of, um, you know, the political blocks that are building around the world. The narrative a few years ago was that uh, there were genuine complaints against China on economic grounds, we'll say, on the transfer of technology, on, on fair access to markets and everything else. There was a broad consensus uh, amongst major leading economies on that front. But as you say, now we're starting to get into this fragmentation. We have Saudi Arabia peeling away from the U.S., apparently peeling closer towards China, for example. We have the whole China-U.S., China-Russia alliance, of course, and President Xi Jinping talking about changes we haven't seen in 100 years when he, when he went to Moscow. We have Brazil and the BRICS formation, that trip by Lula to, Brazil, to Beijing last week, all reinforcing the point that there may be some unity among the U.S. and we'll say Western Europe on some of the issues when it comes to China, but there certainly isn't an overall uh, global approach to, to this issue with China. And even within the Western Europe alliance, it should be said, of course, that France is also sending signals that it has different views on it, too. So I think the, the story is more complicated, the alliances are more fragmented, and it continues to change to what it was even when, say, President Biden took office a few years ago. And the, you've lived this now from both sides, in Hong Kong for a number of years, now in Washington, D.C. What's the difference between the way the Chinese government views the U.S. and the way the U.S. government views the Chinese government? I think, look, I think tension between both now is very high. I mean, once upon a time, Hong Kong would have been considered a fairly neutral playground for both. The U.S. can do business there. China can do business there. It was a meeting of minds. That's obviously seen now as a fairly, as a geopolitical fault line, for example. I've been struck by the sense of urgency in my very short time in Washington, without getting into a hot take, but there is this idea of fragmentation and resilience and reshoring. It's absolutely very real here. I must say. And on China's side, they're obviously very determined to protect their investment, and they're going around the U.S. now. That's why they are reaching out to Brazil, they are reaching out to Saudi Arabia, they are reaching out to Russia. They're looking to circumvent this U.S. approach. I wanted the hot take. That's exactly what I wanted. And a thank you. And a Karen there, down in Washington. That push is real. We felt it last week as well at the IMF World Bank Spring meetings. And this is why there is some pushback against this view coming out of the IMF that rates can return to their pre-pandemic levels because this push is only accelerated and this push might contribute to higher levels. I think about what Ellen Wald said a while ago when it came to a signal of global demand and to gauge the China reopening. And she said that Saudi Arabia holds the key. And Saudi Arabia is having conversations with China about how much crude they need. And that if they decide to cut some of the production, that will be the true signal that perhaps the recovery isn't as quick as people previously thought in China, because that is ultimately how closely connected these two nations are. It speaks to new alliances, and it speaks to a tension of addressing that when you're kind of looking for the old economic model at the IMF, like so many people said, they seem to be trying to portray. I won't offer my hot take on this conversation about but, a wholesale shift but, around foreign exchange and the U.S. dollar. But oh, yeah. no, I think we've got to talk about and highlight the fact that there is a push to de-emphasize the U.S. dollar from, from, from some of these countries. Now, we can talk about the challenges from ultimately shifting away from the U.S. dollar. We haven't got time for that. We've got about two minutes. But story after story, you see it. Story after story, you see it. And China is often at the center of it. 
Well, how about the idea that some of the dollar, that some of the purchases of crude were denominated in UN? This was a couple of weeks ago. There was a story. Nothing massive, nothing like it was going to completely upend the market and change the currency denomination for a significant portion of purchases. But it is a sense that there is some sort of undercurrent moving to diversify away from the dollar, especially because of what happened with Russia and the dollar used as almost a tool of retaliation or a tool of enforcement, making people feel more vulnerable. We'll catch up with Dan Tanabam of Oliver Wyman and maybe bring up some of those themes to discuss. The latest this morning, just on the news front, the Russian President Vladimir Putin and Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman had a phone call a little bit earlier today and talked about OPEC plus cooperation. The two leaders expressed, quote, satisfaction with the level of coordination within OPEC plus in order to ensure the stability of the global oil market. I wonder how the White House feels about that one, Bramo. I mean, right now, the idea that Saudi Arabia is cozying up to Russia, that you could get some sort of cozying up between China and Russia, with the trade data, the fact that trade had increased 135 percent between China and Russia over the past year gives you a sense of how much some of these polls are shifting. The story I think we all missed because we were drowning in financial market tension, banking stress, was the deal that had been brokered by China between Saudi and Iran. Diplomatically, that's a, quite a big deal. Well, yes. I mean, people saying that this was something that Saudi Arabia and Iran had wanted and it wasn't that much of a significant deal, but symbolically, you frame it exactly right. Symbolically, the fact that Saudi Arabia allowed China to try to take a victory lap as a negotiator on the world yeah. stage says a lot. Negative 0.2% on the S&P 500. Coming up shortly, Patrick Armstrong of Plurimi Wealth will get his call on some of the big tech names. Which report next week and the week after that? This is Bloomberg. institution I know of wants you to serve on their board and you're very involved in the art world. What is it about art that attracts you? Well, art is essential in a democracy, David. Art is so important. We know what art does to young people. We know that uh, exposure to art uh, brings about uh, higher levels of empathy. Um, it helps people uh, understand how other cultures, other people live. Um, and it just brings out the kind of humanity in all of us. There are times when I have observed leaders uh, use uh, language that is inhumane while talking about other human beings, while, while talking about the world. Um, and I think to myself, this person has clearly never engaged in beautiful poetry. They've never uh, listened uh, to uh, the words of a great playwright. They've never uh, sat and reflected uh, on a beautiful painting or picture. Uh, because if they uh, had been really uh, educated, had they really been exposed to the arts, um, they wouldn't find it possible to use this kind of language. Business Week Radio. Live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, are you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed yeah. does potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. What's the best investment advice you've ever been given by anybody? The compound interest, the compounding of returns is an incredible miracle of business, finance, and human existence. Everything you learn is additive every day, and if you keep at it and don't quit, it's an incredible miracle. And it's, and it's not just interest. It was, it was always said about compound interest returns, compound business returns compound human returns. They're all very additive because you learn every day. And if you keep at it, it's very, very um, uh, helpful. In your observation of investors, what do you think is the biggest mistake that average investors make? Selling at the wrong time. And they sell when the prices go down? Yes. Or? Yes. Not keeping, look, people have conviction 
or they invest for the if they invest for the right reasons, just keep at it. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. here is you've still got to get through the recession. And yes, we've all been waiting for the recession for a year now. We're not in the camp of forecasting a recession, but we still believe that U.S. growth will not be far off of zero. There has been decent momentum really all year in stocks despite all of the headwinds. It does seem as though the Fed is right to be getting close to a pause here. Even if we did have a mild recession, I don't think they're going to cut all the way to zero. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City, getting you to the weekend. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bramovitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK taking a long weekend. Your equity market negative two tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. The doom and gloom. The bears are not changing their views whatsoever. You heard from Julian Emanuel there of Evercore. We need to get through the recession. I'll catch up with Morgan Stanley's Lisa Shatter a little bit later on this morning. Her view, her argument, her message: Do not look through the. Economy. Economic weakness. Don't look through it. Got to experience it first, Bramo, before you start buying. Lean into the pain. You Something know, like basically, that. you're just like trying that. to tweak me and wind me up. Honestly, I think that this is going to be one of the most difficult moments where you see the uh, money, the, the monetary stimulus being pulled back continually. People talk about M2 and how it's declining. At the same time, that you do see tighter lending conditions, and yet people still want to spend on things. And this is really uh, the conundrum, and we're going to get it at 9:45 a.m. today. Services keep coming in stronger than expected, even as you see people pull back perhaps on how many desks they buy. So that in Europe, where we sit in the U.S., 9.45 Eastern Time, the PMIs in the United States, busy week for financial earnings this week. On to next week, we start to hear from tech. Microsoft on the 25th, alongside Google. Amazon, April 27th, early May, May 4th. Apple, that's going to be a big focus for this market, Lisa, because some of those names have had a tremendous year so far year today. So what have we heard? From Luke Kawa, he said that misses are going to be severely punished, right? We heard from Dan Ives, the classic bull, saying this will be a defining moment for a lot of the earnings of the haves, the have-nots. And then we heard from Dan Suzuki uh, that basically you're going to see them continue to underperform. They haven't gotten that cyclical test, and this will drag the market down potentially as people realize that there just is less demand for some of these products. I think that this will be an interesting macro test, possibly akin to what we've seen with the regional banks in terms of what people spend generally is, but not just people, also businesses with the cloud spending. Oh, without a doubt. Cloud spend for me is the standout. For years we've talked about that as some secular tailwind. Is that now a real cyclical story? Do they start to pull back on some of that? Is that going to show up in that direction? How much can companies continue to invest in the infrastructure and building out some of these things if they're concerned about profit margins, if they're concerned about you know their intellectual security, if they're concerned about keeping the right number of employees in the right mix? This really pressures some of these industries that have been going gangbusters with free money. You mentioned Dan Suzuki. Big question. Can these companies cut costs quickly enough if the revenue line starts to drop away and he doesn't think they can? That seems to be the bottom line for him. I think it depends on which, right? I mean, I think that that sort of goes to the Dan Ives point. Are there going to be some that can, but the rest can't? And I think that we're seeing that tension right now with Tesla, and the reason why people have pointed to it so much is because they were the standout margin play. They had margins that were not akin to the auto manufacturers. Now they're getting a little closer because they're trying to gain market share. And how much is that really going to pressure their valuation in a new way? Stock got punished for that just yeah. yesterday. Margins coming in more than anticipated. This morning we get some price hikes on certain models of Tesla. We'll touch on that story again for you a little bit later. For the broader market, quite simple, negative 0.2% on the S&P 500. No real drama here outside of equities. We're basically unchanged in the bond market through most of this morning on a 10-year 352. 261 on a 10-year maturity. That's your yield right now. 
now in the FX market. The euro essentially unchanged over the last couple of days, Lisa. 109.80 on the single currency, even off the back of that pretty tremendous services PMI data out of the eurozone. Yeah, well, honestly, again, there hasn't been much of a catalyst right now. And you talked about this earlier. I think you said it well. People are looking for that aha moment. Okay, we're heading into recession now. <laughs> or, aha, it's going to be the new, sort of a new bull market, something. And we're not getting it. And it's just sort of this grind of little details and Fed officials being like, eh, you know, like, let's try to figure this out. Which Fed official is that? <laughs> Who sounds like that? <laughs> Basically all of them. They're coming out. They're saying, you know, okay, we're going to raise. We need a little bit more. We're going to tweak our language. We're not sure. We're watching what you're watching. Maybe we'll get some insight, and then we'll talk. Calling your colleagues a fool in the shower. You see that? <laughs> I, I mean, come on. That's over in Europe. If you're just tuning in and you've missed this, welcome, and let me share it with you. One policymaker at the Bank of England, incredibly dovish, as you might have guessed from what she's about to say, Silvana Tenreiro, compared her hawkish colleagues to a fool in the shower who scolds himself by being too impatient to wait for the water to warm up, and then bang, comes down all at once. I think we've all experienced that at some point. That's a nod to Milton Friedman. But I just wonder, can you imagine sharing the committee? With that individual, she's heading for the exit for what it's worth anyway. <laughs> well, I think Maybe that's, that's the why reason it's why sure. scorched earth sure. uh, kind of mentality there. But it really does. I mean, how much is the balance of risk actually shifting? And the difficulty right now is both sides of this debate can prove it with data. And that's the problem because how do you know what's right? You'll have to know when it's too late. She's got two more meetings left. <laughs> they will be fraught. She's going out swinging. <laughs> Patrick Armstrong joins us now, CIO. <laughs> Uh, Plurimi Wealth. Patrick, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. I think we all just want an update from your standpoint on where you are and some of these tech names at the moment going into next week. Um, I own Alphabet. I own Google going into next week. And uh, so I own them. I'm comfortable with them. And I think that's where the whole world is right now. And that's one of the things that makes me scared is that if you look at the S&P 500, year to date, it's up 8.5%. Um, 10 stocks contribute 6.5% of that 8.5% return. The other 490 stocks contributed just 2% of that return. So everyone's worried about a recession. Everyone wants secular growth, defendable profit margins, and you feel really safe in these mega cap techs, um, high quality growth. And I think that's in the price now, to be honest. So I think the risk isn't that these companies miss and fall off a cliff, but they are cyclically exposed and it may be a period of dead money where it takes a long time to catch up with the multiples that some of them are trading at now. So Alphabet, Google, I still, or Apple and Google, I still own their reasonable multiples. They're a little bit expensive now, whereas I think mega cap tech and quality growth is getting quite expensive. Russell uh, 1000 growth is now trading at 80th percentile on all the valuation measures I look at, 26 times earnings. So it's not cheap, a lot of good news and a lot of safety premium is uh, being priced in right now. You mentioned breadth, Patrick. Is narrow breadth alone a problem when we saw that repeatedly over the last decade? Well, I don't know if it's a problem, but I think a mean reversion trade is very likely because everyone's trying to hide from cyclicality, I think, in these quality growth companies, and they've moved up to 30 times earnings, some of them 35 times earnings, other kind of, um, depending on the stock. And it's really important to buy a stock that's at a fair multiple for the growth it's going to deliver. And um, we just sold LVMH, which is an incredible company. I bought it in September last year when it was trading at 19 times earnings. I sold it. It's trading at 31 times trailing, 27 times forward. Um, there's just a lot of great news priced into great companies right now. If you feel safe owning it, it's probably expensive. And I think a mean reversion trade... Um, makes sense right now, where some of the companies that have lagged, that have predictable cash flows, healthcare has been a terrible performer this year, up until recent weeks. I think that's trading at a market multiple, very predictable earnings, strong cash flow generation. I think that's where I'd prefer to be if you are trying to hide from a recession. Well, congratulations on cashing out LVMH uh, with a hefty profit. I want to go back to this idea of dead money that you said with some of the uh, big tech names that you think are great companies but perhaps are not going to exceed their valuations for a sustained period of time. When do you decide to cash out of those and basically uh, try your hand elsewhere versus sticking with it and just allowing the dead money to be a little bit flat? Um, well, it's the 30 handle that gets me a bit worried. When stocks get to 30 times earnings, I've really got to believe that they've got a way to beat the consensus because consensus is bullish. That's what's driving a 30 times um, P multiple. So that's, for me, a level that I start to get a bit worried that everything's in the price. Um, 
the companies where I'm outright short aren't the big cap quality glows, so I still own some of them, but companies like Delivery Hero, um, SoftBank has a bunch of these companies that have no path to profitability, Neo, uh, Rivian. Um, I don't see a path to profitability, and they're still trading at billions of market cap, and those are the stocks that I think are really at risk. Um, the market's convinced the Fed is going to be cutting in the second half of this year. If that happens, that allows multiples to drift higher. But a lot of these companies have cyclical risk as well. If the Fed's cutting, the economy is not so good. So um, sometimes you're hoping for the Fed cutting, allowing big multiples, but it's going to impact earnings as well. These luxury names, you mentioned LVMH is up 31% year to date, Prada's up by 35% and change year to date, MS is up by 37%. MS, can we just finish there? Patrick, that's a name that I know you used to hold. Do you still hold it? Yeah, I still still hold that one. So coming into this year, I thought luxury was the best place to invest because it was trading slightly premium to the market, multiple, and I could see real revenue growth benefiting from China reopening. So I've cut to LVMH. I still own Hermes. It's actually the biggest weight in my portfolio just because it's performed so well. But uh, that's another stock that uh, the same reason I sold LVMH, I've got to be thinking about Hermes. The reason I chose to sell LVMH first more likely to make an acquisition that's dilutive to shareholders, was my worry. Interesting. You think they might still be in the market for something big, Patrick, even they after have Tiffany's? To be. It's, it's the 10th biggest company in the world now. It's producing tons of cash flow. Its whole business model is growing, not just organically, but through acquisitions. So um, if you own companies trading at 30 times earnings, they use that uh, as a currency, and uh, an acquisition I don't think is far off. Patrick, thank you, sir, for weighing in. Patrick Armstrong of Plurimi Wealth. Interesting final thought there yeah, on FVMH, so. right? I mean, do you think it's a Tiffany tie-up? Or do you think it's... What are their luxury players I are out there? I can't think of, of something Lulu as large. Lemon? I'm not sure Lulu quite cracks it. <laughs> I mean, that's the issue, is sort of how do you decide what to go for where it's not some sort of you know brand dilution where you don't have consolidation risk. These are some of the issues, but that's very interesting. Christian Louboutin. Maybe, you know, I'm Look, just throwing I'm out so names. Not what do I know? You need, you need TK Brunello. here. Brunello. Christian Dior. You know, go and get something big. I've got no idea. <laughs> I Brunello, I love. Don't touch Brunello. They probably own it already. <laughs> you're you know, offended. They probably own it already. <laughs> I've got no you're idea. Just, you're genuinely offended. But, but he was also saying is that, you know, this idea of understanding when something is overvalued at a time when people are hiding in what they perceive to be safe is a really interesting one. And you keep bringing this up. What is a safe defensive Oh, asset. yeah. How cyclically exposed are these tech names? You you heard him talk about it there. Neil Dutta's going to join us shortly, not to talk about tech, not to talk about luxury, because none of us know anything about that. <laughs> Just throwing out random names that, that are owned by it other sound, companies. It sounds luxurious. <laughs> Neil Dutta from Nexus <laughs> Macro joining us shortly to talk about the U.S. economy. to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's deputy, Dominic Raab, has quit after an investigation into bullying complaints. The probe criticized Raab's behavior towards civil servants. It's a major blow to Sunak. He's tried to present his government as a contrast to the Boris Johnson era, which was marked by political scandals. President Biden will crack down on US investment in key parts of China's economy. Bloomberg's learned he'll sign an executive order in the coming weeks that will limit investing in Chinese semiconductors, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. The president's hoping to get the backing of its G7 partners. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will test the international waters ahead of a possible decision to run for president. DeSantis will pay a courtesy call on Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida during an international trade mission. A new Wall Street Journal poll shows DeSantis trailing Donald Trump 51 to 38 among likely Republican primary voters. And Procter & Gamble has raised its sales projection for the year ending in June. The maker of Bounty Paper Towels and Herbal Essence Shampoo cited higher prices and a slight increase in demand for some of its products. Meanwhile, P&G's quarterly results beat estimates and key metrics. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, trying to open. This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. Welcome to the world of decentralized finance. You can see the massive gains for the OG crypto coin. The breakout we have all perhaps long awaited finally realized. We'll see if it sticks. Bloomberg's covering all things crypto, the people. There's no question this industry is composed of some bad actors and some good actors. The transactions. Volumes have surpassed $24 billion per day. And the technology. Stop talking about the technology. Start demonstrating the utility. Bloomberg Crypto, Tuesdays. Markets come down in Europe from the financial centers of the world. Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson in London and Alex Steele in New York. Real-time numbers, real-time analysis, weekdays. Earning season is here. We haven't had a shocker yet. They are minting money. Markets are still volatile. I think it's going to be choppy. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. First quarter results, impressive. The revenue beat is amazing. With exclusive expert analysis. This is really important to watch. Buy on the fear, sell on the news. Where is the upside in this market? Do we get answers to that today? The bottom line speaks for itself, and that's what moves markets. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. This is not a credit crunch, this is a credit contraction. And there is a difference. A credit crunch is economy-wide, it has massive implication. A credit contraction has distributional effects. So we should be talking about the distributional effects, that's issue number one, and unfortunately that's going to hit small businesses harder than big business. Brilliant to catch up with Mohammed al Erin, as always, Bloomberg Opinion columnist and Queen's College Cambridge president as well. Your equity market right now positive or rather negative by a tenth of 1% on the S&P. One hour and 13 minutes away from the opening bound. We're negative 0.07% on the oh S&P 500. Huge Trying to recover. <laughs> the price change, there just isn't much yes. outside of equities in the bond market unchanged. 353 on a 10 year in the FX market, euro dollar positive 0.1%, 109.80. Moments ago, Patrick Armstrong of Plurimi talking up selling gown for MH because he thinks they're going to make an acquisition and followed by Bramo and I mentioning a bunch of companies that Alvia <laughs> Mate already owns. <laughs> People writing in, thank N you. Name, name a luxury fund firm and basically they already own it over I, at Alvia Mate. I mean, it already is some sort of a uh, huge consolidated luxury uh, player, but at a certain point, if they have to acquire somebody else, where do they go? MS. They don't Apple. own that. They don't own that. Just I mean, to like, throw that out there. <laughs> That's maybe Apple's maybe the one company they, they can't afford. Just, just to one. be clear. Yeah. Let's get back to something we might know something about with Dan Tanabam <laughs> of Oliver Wyman. Dan joins us now. Dan, wonderful to catch up with you, buddy. I want to build on the reporting from our colleague Jenny Leonard from earlier on this morning that President Biden aims to sign an executive order in the coming weeks that will limit investment in key parts of China's economy by American businesses. Dan, where do you see this one going? Yeah, no, thanks, John. I mean, this outbound CFIUS, as it's been labeled for the, the last few months, is, is really the culmination of a focus of the Biden administration for the last two years. And I actually spent some time on the Hill a few weeks ago with some senior House GOP members that have been looking at this as well. I mean, this is actually something that, one, is a very bipartisan issue in the U.S. I think also you're going to begin to see more clarity as there has been a lot of investor concern on what does this actually look like? Because we've seen in the past, the U.S. government attempted to regulate certain or limit investment in certain Chinese companies, and it had a pretty adverse impact on threats to delist um, and other sorts of challenges. But really, this executive order is going to cover specific investment of semiconductor companies, artificial intelligence and quantum computing companies in China, with a focus on U.S. firms playing an active role in management. So venture and private equity firms um, are really under the magnifying glass where they're largely managing and not just taking a passive investment in some of these specific sectors, not anything necessarily more broadly. Dan, forgive me for asking you to read the political tea leaves, but Jenny pointing out that this push will take place at this May summit for the G7 in Japan. Do you think the Allies will be on board with this push coming from the U.S. side? 
Yeah, it's something I've been looking at as well. I, I'm not sure how much Allied support really exists for this package, and this only has a chance of any sort of success with multilateral support. Otherwise, you're just going to essentially open up opportunities for other G7-plus allies to take the investments that American businesses are essentially restricted or investors are restricted from. You know, I think the U.S. administration has had a pretty good track record of beginning to gin up support for these type of issues. I think a lot of the challenge has been the confusion of what is this? And again, it's really been labeled as outbound CFIUS for the last few months, which takes on a much broader connotation than what we're talking about here, which is a narrower swath of Chinese firms and what type of investment restrictions would really be placed on U.S. companies. Dan, you were at the IMF meetings uh, last week. What's your read on how aware policymakers are on what kind of hit economically there would be if there was some sort of true fragmentation or a breakdown in the relationship between China and the U.S.? Firstly, I can't believe that was a week ago, but that's a second issue. Um, I think there are a lot, of, a, a lot of concerns, and this is where this Biden administration team in, in Treasury is very careful about looking for unintent, unanticipated consequences, especially when doing, dealing with anything that has broader market impact. I think there's a huge focus on not disrupting um, you know, the China, U.S., China, Western efforts from a business standpoint, because there's still a substantial amount of trade. I think the decoupling threats have been somewhat overblown by the numbers, and, and Bloomberg certainly covered this as well. But I think there's a huge recognition that you can't only play around with this relationship too much before it has too many adverse consequences. I mean, who can forget at the end of the Trump administration, one exchange that was delisting, then not delisting, then delisting certain Chinese telecom companies that created some pretty massive confusion for a number of weeks. Well, but Dan, to just sort of spin this forward then, how comprehensive can some of these restrictions be that the Biden administration plans to put out there? How much meat can there be behind what Janet Yellen had to say last week about uh, the potential to put national security over economic interest? Yeah, it, it's a balancing act. I mean, there's obviously national security concerns. There's IP protection concerns. Um, you know, it's hard to say that they don't have broader economic protections for the U.S. economy as well. I mean, really, this is the investment restriction equivalent of some of the bans that the U.S. government has put in place, as well as certain other European nations on the ability for China to import certain high-tech components they need to potentially catch up in some of their technology manufacturing. Dan, just a final word on enforcement. We mentioned your name a little bit earlier on this morning, just with regards to foreign exchange and the U.S. dollar. Dan, a de-emphasis around the U.S. dollar, a push for that coming from China, other countries as well, just based, implied by some of the actions, agreements we've seen develop over the last month. Dan, where do you see that one heading? Yeah, I, I've had this discussion with your Saleya Mosin a number of times over the last five years. Look, we've heard the de-dollarization threat for the last 15 years as the U.S. has tried to force other countries to certainly choose in foreign policy decisions. I'm not sure that the world is going to move off the dollar quite so fast. And while we have seen larger countries like Brazil kind of push for this, India look to settle certain transactions outside of the dollar, I still don't know if the dollar dominance is going to erode quite so quickly. Dan, I think a lot of people listening to this right now might agree with you. Dan Tanabad there of Oliver Wyman. Coming up in the next hour on Bloomberg TV, looking forward to this. Great way to round out the week with this team here. Lisa Shannon of Morgan Stanley, Mike Collins of P. Jim, Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genomity. We'll catch up with Tony around the opening bell. Lisa Shannon and Mike Collins with a lot to talk about around the Federal Reserve. Fixed income markets, Bramo, and ultimately in the equity market as well. Lisa's got a point, Lisa Shannon, and ultimately the message is don't look through this economic weakness. It's going to hurt. She thinks this is a dangerous moment for the equity market. A lot of people would agree. I mean, that's what we heard from Dan Suzuki as well, that basically, you know, it, this is what always happens before a downturn. You get certain rallies that keep coming back, and then all of a sudden people kind of settle into uh, what becomes more obvious. The question that I have is, if it's not this earnings season, then what's it going to be? It's not going to be the May 8th senior loan officer survey. There isn't going to be one data point that just changes everything. So what is going to be the catalyst that changes a direction in something more material, or is it going to just be this grind, this sort of angst for the rest of the year? It's a process, is probably the phrase of the week, isn't it? Yeah. It's a process. Yeah, well, process and nuance doesn't really work well 
in markets or politics for that or matter. Or Southside <laughs> research sometimes exactly. either. You want that headline, don't you, that exactly. just says South, 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 bye, bye, bye. I do sometimes think, it's more nuanced. I do think that next week the tech earnings are going to be really interesting. And I, I do think that they will be nuanced because it's not going to be necessarily a make it or break it kind of moment, as Dan Suzuki correctly uh, uh, punted back at me. But I do think it's going to be telling as far as where we're going with the economy and the goods versus the services within tech and which is getting the money. And I think that'll be interesting. Dan Tannenbaum's right. A week? That was a week ago? It feels like forever. A week ago? I know. It's gone by so quickly. Exactly. And, I mean, again, this has been a really tough week. I mean, it's just been basically range-bound. It's snoozy now. It's nice and quiet. It's good, Bramo. Cheer up. It's mm -hmm. great. Going into the weekend, nice and quiet. <laughs> TK's taking a long I'm weekend. great. Just to enjoy himself. Kick By the back. way, can I just uh, make a correction? Earlier I said 1946 with the plastic over the furniture. It was more like the 70s, I think. That oh, that it was, was the more, 70s. That was more of like, yeah, that but was... But the 40s feel like the 70s to you. Tom's going to love this when we talk about it on Monday. <laughs> we're not going to talk about it. That's what we're going to do. Or rather, the 70s feel like the 40s, but you get the point. In the equity market, we're down by 0.05% on the S&P 500. Yields are unchanged, 353.37 on a 10-year from a beautiful New York City. Good morning to you all. the first, you know, call it 18 years at Chipotle, this was, you come into Chipotle along the line, you interact with the crew, and you customize your meal. We've got this separate make line, and it's digitized, and so the orders come in, and they're they're really kind of staged so that if you say at noon, I want to come in at 1 o'clock, we hold that order, and we will send it to the crew like maybe 10 to 1, right. so it's ready right when you pull up your car. How do you manage these kind of two different staffing needs, right? Yes. And making sure you have the right amount of people yes. at, the, at the right right time. We spend a lot of time uh, projecting sales. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, it's part art, part science. We're trying to bring more science and more AI into it. Because yeah. if you get the right sales projection, then you know exactly what your, sale, what your staffing needs to be. So if you get the sales right, you can get the entire restaurant staffed perfectly with just a couple people. Our, our average restaurant now does about um, over a million dollars per restaurant in digital sales. Welcome to the world of decentralized finance. You can see the massive gains for the OG crypto coin. The breakout we have all perhaps long awaited finally realized. We'll see if it sticks. Bloomberg's covering all things crypto, the people. There's no question this industry is composed of some bad actors and some good actors. The transactions. Volumes have surpassed $24 billion per day. And the technology. Stop talking about the technology. Start demonstrating the utility. Bloomberg Crypto, Tuesdays.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome back. About an hour before the opening bell here in New York, John's off to his 9 a.m. property. Tom taking a long weekend. And we are here without economic data now. We will get some at 9.45 a.m. Eastern when we get the services and uh, the manufacturing PMIs for the U.S. The expectation is that it will follow the trend that we saw over in Europe earlier this morning with respect to services coming in hot and manufacturing coming in soft. This conversation I've heard I will need boxing gloves for, so I am prepared. Neil Dutta joining us right now, head of U.S. economic research at Renaissance Macro. And I am curious about your view after hearing all of the pessimistic prog uh, prognostications about why we should remain bearish, why you're coming on now to tell us we are all completely misguided and we need to be a little bit more optimistic. Well, good to see you, Lisa. Happy Friday. <laughs> Happy Friday. Uh, um, you know, look, I mean, I think what this business is about is about um, what the consensus is pricing in and what the likely outcome is going to be. Uh, that's, how, uh, that's how we dif distinct, you know, create some distinction here. And remember, the consensus is basically priced for, you know, essentially sudden stop dynamics in the economy. I mean, people are calling for a recession starting, you know, sometime this week, it feels like. Um, and I got to tell you, that's just not in the data. I mean, in my view, the time to have been concerned about recession was last year. I mean, it's not to say that we're not worried about things now, but it would have been more prudent to be even more worried last year. You had energy prices spiking. The global economy was going down the tubes, right? I mean, people are worried about Europe, whether they're going to be able to keep the heat and the lights on. Uh, China was slowing down. Um, in the U.S., we had... The housing market weakening, fiscal tightening, right? The, um, yeah. you know, and, and all the rest of it. So think about each of these things in turn, right? Fiscal policy, that's a tailwind for the economy now. Uh, there is no fiscal drag. Um, the government's a tailwind for growth. Uh, housing, take so a look at a chart of home building stocks. Anybody have that on their bingo card for 2023? <laughs> I think that people and missed a lot of things. The global PMIs that came out this morning. Now, admittedly, the manufacturing piece of it wasn't as strong, but you know, it's pretty clear that global growth in the aggregate is stronger so far this year than it was before. So, if the consensus is talking about you know some sort of cliff dive moment in the second quarter, uh, that's not happening. It doesn't mean that you don't pencil in a recession. I mean, I do think that. If you want to be honest with yourself, you have to kind of keep this in the baseline outlook for the next 18 months. But the question is whether it's going to happen imminently, because that's what the consensus is expecting. Well, and um, I don't really see it uh, in the data. Neil, there are two aspects of this. There's growth and there's inflation. And what we have seen is that growth has slowed, uh, but it has not cratered in the same kind of way to, to highlight what you're talking about. And in certain sectors, has actually accelerated. But inflation seems to be coming down. Do you believe that this can continue, that you will see the sort of disinflation at the same time that there still is a lot of momentum underpinning the growth? Oh, wow. You, Lisa Abramowitz, growth in some parts of the economy accelerated. Man, that must have tasted like vinegar coming out of your mouth, Well, right? I've, I've actually bought airplane tickets, so I understand that in some areas <laughs> there is complete capacity. Carry on. Uh, look, I think, to me, it, it actually feels a little bit... Um, I mean, I might get crucified for saying this, but Please, it does feel on. a little bit. It does feel a little bit like a soft landing. I mean, um, at the margin, the data is consistent with soft landing. I mean, think about what you just said. Inflation is slowing down. Activity is holding up. Right. I mean, you, you look at some of what the early reads are for auto sales in April. They're pointing to sequential acceleration, Lisa, for for auto sales in April, despite this financing costs and the rest of it, and. The builders are doing the same thing, sequential improvement in activity in April. So remember, everyone was talking about how housing is a leading indicator, and because housing was, was collapsing in 2022, that was going to spell the death uh, of the economy in early 2023. Well, now housing's reaccelerating, and it's highly likely that single-family residential construction picks up um, over the next few months. Well, so... so I hear what Go you're ahead. saying, Neil, and I think that a lot of people would agree with you, which is the reason why you've seen the rallies year to date that has surprised a lot of people, even in some of the areas that people had left for dead or said that they were going to underperform. Now, however, a lot of people are saying, just wait for it, because the tightening credit conditions are going to really play out. And we're starting to see it around the margins with loan originations and credit loss provisions. How do you push back against that and say, look, it's just not going to happen. It's not that big of a drag. This happens as a feature of every single tightening cycle that we've ever had. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not good. The question is whether that's enough to push the economy into a below potential growth state that pushes up the unemployment rate. And I think um, we're not there yet. I mean, if you and, you know, speaking to the point about credit, keep in mind, um, the housing market's working. That must mean that credit is flowing to households. Um, but more broadly, if you take a look at loan and leases or loan growth, um, you know, bank credit relative to GDP, um, it's basically been flat since 2016, 2017. So perhaps the economy is not nearly as credit sensitive as as, as is being made out to be. Um, you know, what I see is the reason why the economy has been holding up is because, is because consumers have been doing okay. And the reason they're doing okay is because disposable incomes have been holding up. And that's going to continue because lower natural gas prices will bleed into household utilities. And, you know, the fact that, um, you know, wholesale gasoline futures have been declining, that's probably going to show up in lower pump prices in coming weeks. Um, so we're not going to get as much of a, uh, a food and energy and, frankly, uh, food tax a a as we've seen. And that's going to push up disposable income, which in turn will support consumer spending. Um, so I, I think that the, the credit sensitivity of the economy, um, you know, it certainly affects some sectors. I mean, I don't want to, you know, sort of sound like everything's great here, but, uh, you know, my, my sense is that disposable income growth will remain relatively uh, stable uh, and probably continue climbing in the second quarter. Neil, yeah, you said and that I you... Think that's, and I think that's an important story. You said that you think that you'll get crucified by saying that uh, this is looking a lot like a soft landing. I would actually beg to differ. I think that probably people will say, yes, finally saying the quiet part out loud because the market agrees with you. It seems like the equity markets are pricing in a soft landing right now a lot in a lot of sectors. Do you disagree? I mean, how much is this already priced in? Not necessarily the recession calls that people keep waiting for. I think there's more room to go. I mean, I, I do think that you, you probably uh, continue to see, uh, you know, growth holding up. Um, you know, I think you start to see parts of the inflation picture continue to imp continue to improve somewhat. Um, you know, we did see shelter come in quite a bit uh, in uh, in March. And remember, that's very inertial. It's sticky. So it's not going to start to reaccelerate uh, right away. Uh, so I think that that's an important development. And you know, when I think about the Fed, I mean, they're they're closer to the end of this than not. So it's unlikely that they're going to begin ratcheting up hikes immediately as well. So um, um, I, I do think you can make a, a case for equities here, um, you know, over the over the next uh, you know couple of quarters uh, for, for equities uh, to rally. And we continue to see a tailwind as well from from what's going on globally. Uh, that'll continue to pressure take pressure, I think, off the dollar. Um, which should provide earnings support for a lot of the uh, the cyclical names that do a lot of business overseas. How, um, how much do you see tech participating in this, especially with the earnings coming up next week? Are they still going to be the leaders at a time when there are a lot of areas that could perhaps recover if what you're saying comes to pass? Well, if the Fed is backing off, which I think is likely at some point this summer, um, you know that should uh, that should provide some talent for, for for technology stocks given their rate sensitivity how do you push back against the idea that we're getting right now sentiment really shifting and we saw that in the leading economic indicators we saw that in the fed beige book we saw that when it comes to just marginal softening in the labor market around the edges and yes you could say it's just marginal on the other hand it's starting it's starting in a more meaningful way now how do you say that is just par for the course, it's controlled, it's not going to pick up more meaningfully. Well, I mean, it's something that you have to be concerned about. I mean, the, to me, the risk is that, you know, you get this sort of, you know, snowballing effect in unemployment. But, you know, I would just say that they're offsets. It's very rare. I mean, people are pointing to continuing claims. Obviously, they're up, I think, like, what, 40% from the lows. Um, but you've also, typically, when that's happened, that's always been a recession. But then again, what about this recovery has been typical? As that's happened, you've seen prime age employment rates rise to cycle highs. That's never happened. You know, typically, when continuing claims rise this much off the low, the prime age employment rate is already declining. It's off about you know, anywhere from three tenths to half a percentage point from its from its peak, from its cycle peak, hasn't happened. Right now, it's still going up to new highs. Yeah, uh, consumer attitudes about the labor market still very, very strong. So I think it's really hard to know ex ante, uh, and I think people should be a little bit more uh, show a little bit more like humility about this. It's very difficult to know ex ante whether um, you know this is the start of something truly nefarious or just 
a normalization of labor market conditions from unsustainably hot level hot rates uh, last year. Uh, my sense is that there are offsets, Lisa. I mean, you have global growth getting better. You have U.S. housing. You have fiscal tailwind. Um, now you're going to have real income still holding up. Um, and you have the Fed backing off, uh, you know, sometime after, like probably in June. Um, and I think the risk is, is that, you know, the, I mean, they may have to come in later. That to me still is the risk, but I think you can make a case here um, for risk assets, um, you know, over the next couple of quarters, um, when you get this sort of confluence of slowing inflation, growth holding up, um, Fed backing off. I guess that, Neil, before we have to end, I do want to just raise this one issue. And I think you're right about the humility point, and I feel it, and I think broadly I hear it all the time. I wonder about the fact that suddenly deposits aren't free anymore and the longer-term implications of that in the main credit impulse of this economy, which is the smaller regional banks. How do you factor that into your calculus at a time when that has to be before it happens? It cannot be with any material data just yet. No, I mean, I, look, I take that point. There are there are certainly uh, areas of, of concern uh, within the banking system. I mean, I think obviously people have been talking a lot about commercial real estate, but uh, and, and the how the regional banks um, drive credit to that sector of the economy. But it's also important to remember that, you know, when we think about structures investment in GDP, Lisa, that has rarely been as low a share of GDP as it is right now. Right. So even if you're talking about a 20% drop in structures investment annualized. Yeah. That probably gets you maybe half a point off of GDP growth. So, so um, you know, as I say, I mean, th th there are issues. And clearly, um, you know, residential lending, I think, continues. And that's a big piece of it, too, right? Yeah. So households are still getting credit when they want it. Um, but I take your point about what's going on with the small business. The question is, you know, there are areas of, 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 you know, of the economy that are weak, that look very bad, right? I mean, uh, no right. one's denying that. The question is, is that enough to push the economy into a below potential growth state? Remember, that's what's required, yeah. right? I mean, the Fed believes we need below potential growth for a period of time to um, basically quell the inflation issue. The question is whether we're getting it. I don't, I don't see it yet. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Don't be a stranger. I love speaking with you. I will put on my boxing gloves any day. Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro, thank you. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In the UK, complaints by government workers have brought down Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's close ally. Deputy Prime Minister Dominic Raab resigned after an independent investigation criticized his treatment of civil servants. The probe into accusations of bullying lasted months, and it threatened to undermine Sunak's pledge to restore professionalism to the government. The U.S. wants to cut its dependence on Taiwan's microchips because of concerns that China might invade the island. Now Taiwan, Taiwanese officials are quietly urging their American counterparts to tone down the rhetoric. They're worried that U.S. comments are harming their business interests. President Biden may formally launch his re-election campaign as early as next week. The president's aides have planned for the possibility of making a video announcement to coincide with the anniversary of his previous campaign launch. He's been signaling that he intends to seek a second term next year, making it somewhat of an open secret. The biggest global luxury conglomerate is shifting resources out of Hong Kong. Bloomberg has learned that LVMH wants to focus more on its investment in mainland China cities. Hong Kong used to be Asia's premium shopping hub, but mainland Chinese consumers have switched to buying luxury goods in their home cities. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
big idea is we show the productivity increases that are possible uh, because of artificial intelligence. It's these companies who could be some of the biggest uh, beneficiaries if they harness AI correctly. I think a lot of people are looking for the killer app, like they, they look like these uh, viral apps that the internet delivered. The killer app for artificial intelligence is productivity gains. And any company does not harness it uh, is probably not going to be one of the big winners out there. And just one other thing on AI. The real winners here are going to be those companies that have proprietary data and have lots of it have the best domain expertise, best AI expertise, the best pools of high quality data to basically create new businesses. People ask me all the time, what is the key to being a really good investor? And I tell them it's to surround yourself with and work with the best investors you can find. On Bloomberg Wealth, I'm going to take you to meet the greatest investors in the world, the people that I would like to have managing my money. While I like home runs and grand slams in baseball, at A-Rod Corp here, we shoot for singles and doubles, and we definitely never want to strike out. On the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations, I uncover the untold stories of the world's most successful leaders. Watch Wednesdays on Bloomberg Television. Get your fixed income fix. Watch Bloomberg Real Yield every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern right here on Bloomberg, your global business authority. should probably be closer to zero or negative. You know, if inflation is going to be 3% next year or, heaven forbid, 4% next year, you know, then how low can the Fed go in terms of nominal rates? Perhaps 2, 1. You know, but I do think if the uh, if the unemployment rate is rising, we see it peaking at 55 next year. It's very similar to what happened after the savings and loan crisis. If you get that much weakening in the labor market, the Fed has to take real rates negative. That was Priya Misra, head of global rates uh, strategy at TD Securities, calling for for Fed funds rates to possibly go as a base case to two or two and a half percent. The question wasn't whether the Fed would cut rates, but how quickly, in her view, based on the expectation that there will be a recession and unemployment to rise. A very different view from Neil Dutta, who was just on earlier saying there is no recession that's apparent in the data right now. Those dueling views are what's underpinning a lot of the range bound markets over the past couple of weeks. One area that has not been range bound this week has been in the crude market. I'm looking right now, Brent crude. A down more than 5% this week, the biggest weekly loss going back to uh, March 17th in the immediate aftermath, the turmoil of the banking crisis. A real question around the why at a time of data that just isn't terrible. It's not been great this week, but it's not been terrible. Bloomberg's Julian Lee, who covers all things crude, uh, joining us now. Julian, what's your read on the why in terms of the narrative shift in oil markets? I, I think the why is that there are um, growing concerns that uh, demand isn't going to grow as strongly as, as forecasters have been predicting and that that is going to weigh uh, on oil markets in the, the particularly in the second half of the year but in, in the, the second quarter as well. Um, if you look at the, the sort of the breakdown of forecasts by people like the International Energy Agency, a lot of their demand growth um, is very much skewed into the sort of the period from now to the end of the year. Um, and there are some fears that uh, we're seeing a, a glut of diesel um, and, and other middle distillates emerging perhaps in Asia. Uh, that could lead to refiners cutting back a bit on how much uh, oil they're processing. There are uh, growing concerns as, as you know, some of the earlier guests have been suggesting uh, around the, the strength of economic growth or the the, the, the rolling back of, of some of the strength of economic growth in, in the Atlantic, in, in both the US and in Europe, um, that will have a knock-on effect on oil demand. And, and so there are concerns uh, that, that growth might not be as strong as, as people have been predicting. And then on the supply side, yes, we've, we've had this announcement of um, cuts from uh, some OPEC plus members. They haven't come into effect yet. The one country that has said it's cutting output is, is Russia, uh, but there's really no sign of that 
uh, flowing through into exports from Russia. And that's what really matters for the global oil market. I'm struggling with the narrative shifts that we're seeing in a lot of different areas of the economy. But it's not just crude. And I think that that's important because we've seen a lot of distortions that have been specific to this market and some people accusing OPEC plus of acting in a political manner by cutting production in response to an anticipation in a drop off in activity. But it's the broader commodity complex. It's copper, Dr. Copper, it's iron ore, it's across the board. So Julian, how much can we look at this and say something here is going on and perhaps it has something to do with the strength of China's recovery? Yeah, I, I absolutely think we, we can um, start to, to look at that. And I think there are real questions about uh, the strength of China's recovery going forwards and, and how um, that recovery is going to link to commodities prices generally. I mean, we've become, uh, I think, very fixed on this idea that, that Chinese growth um, flows through to commodities very, very quickly and very, very strongly. Um, and what we might be seeing is something of a, a, a bit of a shift in uh, the strength of that flow through, perhaps, and that the, uh, the Chinese economy may um, recover um, a little bit more through domestic consumer spending rather than these very commodity intensive um, infrastructure investments that perhaps have driven a lot of the growth in the past. You know, I, the other issue, Julian, is that we talk a lot about how manufacturing is, is lower and underperforming, but the services are growing and that people want to have experiences. They are flying around in potentially uh, rates that are exceeding what we saw pre-pandemic. People are driving. People are using all of these forms of fossil fuels as they go around the world. How does that factor into uh, calls for potentially lower oil prices ahead? if that's only ramping up heading into the summer? Well, I think, I think it's, it's a matter of, of one sector balancing out another. Um, you know, if, if, we're, if we are seeing a pickup in, in transport, and it may be uh, that, that flights are getting fuller, um, as well as, you know, more flights being put on, the, 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 the growth in passenger numbers first will fill up the, the flights that are already going. Um, before people start scheduling uh, more flights. Um, um, but if you've got growth in the transport sector uh, being offset by uh, lower consumption in manufacturing, in construction, uh, those two may well weigh each other, you know, balance each other out to, to some degree. Um, and, and that, I think, um, is what we're perhaps seeing at the moment, that um, the... The, the growth in transport demand is is coming, um, but that's still a month or two away as as people sort of perhaps uh, start thinking much more about taking holidays in the summer. Um, and we're not quite there yet. so this is this is still, I think, looking ahead a little bit. Meanwhile, Julian, as you sit there in London, I am curious about your view from Europe in the sense that we dodged a bullet this year. Some people attributed to uh, ongoing exports of, from Russia that have been funneled through other areas in the refined form, but as well as a much warmer than expected winter. How much do you really see this as a permanent state of greater resilience, in less of an energy source from Russia? Well, I think Europe is, is taking quite significant steps towards uh, building up a resiliency. But I don't think anybody here is is complacent uh, that just because we've got through uh, this last winter, that the next one will be um, a walk in the park. Uh, we are very aware uh, that this winter has been uh, mild, that uh, natural gas demand, electricity demand has been lower because of that. But there have been, I think, across large parts of Europe, um, real steps taken uh, both to diversify supplies and, and liquefied natural gas from the U.S. and elsewhere has played a big part of that. But there have been steps to uh, reduce consumption. Um, you know, we're seeing that both on a, a national level with governments taking the lead, but we're also seeing it, I think, on an individual level um, where high prices have led people to put on an extra sweater, turn the heating down, turn lights off um, to a much greater extent than they than they have done in the past. Um, and that, I think, has allowed quite significant savings um, of energy, which bode 
reasonably well for the coming winter, I think. And if you add to that the fact that um, natural gas stockpiles um, are being replenished quite quickly, um, partly because of the, the warmer winter that we've had, they didn't get drawn down so far. Um, that means, I think, that Europe should have a pretty solid buffer of, of gas uh, in storage ahead of the coming winter. Um, but, you know, we are very aware that we had some Russian gas still coming into Europe um, last year uh, by pipeline. We may have very, very little, if any at all, this yeah. year. Julian Lee, thank you so much for being with us uh, as we try to parse through some of the uh, market moves. And just to give you a sense, Exxon and Chevron both reporting a week from today. So possibly we'll get a sense of what kind of earnings view they look for going out as well as the supply demand dynamic. Uh, this out of Downing Street, uh, that UK uh, Prime Minister, uh, Richie Sunak, is appointing Oliver Dowden as a new Deputy Prime Minister this coming after the former UK Deputy Prime Minister, Dominique Robb, said that he was going to step down. He was going to resign after an independent investigation criticized his abrasive treatment of civil servants. He said on Twitter earlier this morning in a letter to Sunak, uh, saying, I feel duty-bound to accept the outcome of the inquiry. A difficult moment, really, for Rishi Sunak, considering that Dominique Robb was a major ally in trying to rebuild uh, the administration after Boris Johnson. We will keep uh, getting a sense of that. Really a fraught time, especially with inflation still coming in, with double digits, but real questions about how resilient the economy is at a time of ongoing angst around the inflation picture, but also salaries and economic momentum in markets. We can see a bit range bound after a week trying to digest all of the shifts that we have seen over the past few weeks for the best moments from surveillance and daily insights from the show. Don't forget our daily news letter. Sign up at Bloomberg.com slash surveillance. This is Bloomberg. happening on Wall Street. I'm quite encouraged. The center is holding. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. A lot of these areas still have very, very good valuations. From businesses most influential and instrumental. It's knocking it out of the ballpark. Now's not a great time to be speculative. It's time for a pivot. We're talking about a significant hit to our standard of living. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live tonight with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Chris, can I ask my landlord for a rent cut when in the next couple months? Like, is it is that reasonable? <laughs> well, I, I, I guess it depends when you signed your lease, Joe. It okay. sounds like you got kind of one of those pandemic deals yeah. that, you know, particularly in New York City, where yes. rents actually fell really sharply in that first year of the pandemic. Uh, so we are really seeing the market having turned a corner a little bit over these past few months. Prices have been coming down uh, for four straight months now in our, our national rent index. Wow. Uh, but, you know, if, if you're still paying that uh, late 2020 level, then you might not necessarily right, uh, right. be uh, eligible for a discount Good at this point. point. Good point. Right, I have another question, which is like, so I have two kids, but unlike other people, I actually am cool and I don't want to move to the suburbs. Like, <laughs> I I, This see. episode is just Joe taking like <laughs> advice on handling his rent. Yeah, I just want to point out, uh, I really like my landlord. You love your landlord? She is, she's very <laughs> attentive. We have a very good relationship. So even though I started the episode saying I was anxious, if she is listening to this, I hope uh, she hears <laughs> that uh, I really enjoy where we live and I really enjoy our uh uh, the, the, the landlord. She kind of should uh, factor yes. your consistency yes, yes, exactly. into her pricing Fact, algorithm. Never been, yes, yes, exactly. Excellent. Steve's ability on the course may not be etched into any record books, but no, following him around, no, it's no, clear no, that it's no, not for lack of trying. Jeez. We were constantly hustling behind him as he caught up with executives in the portfolio companies and reminisce with former and current players. He was a day trader. He bought himself 
Self, self-made, dead great. Yeah. And so he's on the bus after a game in New England, and he's day trading on the bus, and Bill Belichick sees him and cuts him on the spot. You know, in many ways, it's a convention, right, of the people that I don't see maybe once a year. And so it's kind of all come together, my firm, our charity, our fundraising efforts, and then the friends that are around, my dad and my brother. It all happens right there as a confluence of all these parts of my life that have found its common center. This is Bling Bang. Looking like a quiet end to a busy week. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures just about unchanged on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. from New York coming up. Fed officials committed to a pause after one more hike. President Biden may deliver a re-election announcement next week and price cuts at Tesla are followed by price hikes. We begin with the big issue. It's the Fed's last word. A bunch of Fed speak coming out. The Fed meeting. Right now they're in a bind. The Fed is, 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 is in a box. The message we've been hearing all this week. Inflation is sticky. They need to continue on this inflation battle. The biggest worry for the Fed, what keeps them up at night, is that inflation becomes unanchored. They've been telling us, and I don't know what more they have to do to get larger parts of the market to believe them. They need credibility. Being very behind the curve, uh, they've had to chase the rate hikes. It seems like they will stick with that language of data dependent. I don't see how we can continue to play this short-term data game. There's a time and consistency issue. What they're trying to do is go a little too high to prove a point, let the economy soften and come back down. The big question is, what do they do after May? We are this far away from the quiet period before that May meeting of the Federal Reserve. Joining us now to discuss is Morgan Stanley's Lisa Shallett, P. Jims, Mike Collins. To the two of you, thank you for being with us. Lisa, I guess the first question, is the May hike going to be the last hike of this cycle? Uh, look, I think it remains to be seen. Right now, um, that's certainly what the market is pricing. Uh, I, I think that, you know, as some of your uh, earlier guests in the preview to this mentioned, uh, you know, we're in this period where the market, particularly the equity markets, are just defying uh, Fed guidance and Fed rhetoric. And as a result, uh, I think to prove their resolve, there is not a zero chance that they keep going. Uh, and so, you know, with, with um, you know, the data the way it is, certainly we can be constructive that inflation is uh, on the right track and that there does seem to be some weakening in the labor market. But this is not by any stretch mission accomplished. Uh, and, you know, we could come back to look at this if they do pause uh, as a moment of very big mistake. We've had so many Fed officials speaking in the last 24 hours going into this quiet period. Mike Collins, this was from Patrick Harker of the Philadelphia Federal Reserve. He said, I anticipate that some additional tightening may be needed once we've reached that point, which should happen this year. I expect that we will hold rates in place and let monetary policy do its work. Let monetary policy do its work. Mike Collins, I've heard that repeatedly in the last 24 hours. Are they just about done? Yeah, absolutely, Jonathan. Uh, I think the May 3rd meeting will be their last uh, hike for the cycle. The big question uh, is what do they do after that, right? And if there's a risk to their actions, it's not that they don't hike enough at this point, it's that they don't cut quickly enough, right? By the end of the year or in the next 12, 24 months, inflation will probably have a three handle. The question is, do they move that funds rate back to where it belongs on top of inflation around three, or do they keep it at five and a quarter for too long like they normally do until they're forced to cut. Uh, so, so I worry about the risk uh, really to, to how quickly they cut. And then we've got to work out what that means for financial markets. Lisa, you and I have been talking about this for weeks, if not months now. The market has become very comfortable with the idea of rate cuts. It's supportive of risk assets. We spend much less time talking about being uncomfortable with why they might be cutting. I sense from you, Lisa, repeatedly that you're focused more on the latter and not on the former. 
No, exactly right. And, and you know, Jonathan, I, I know, you know, you know that, that we've been talking about a narrative around, you know, suddenly bad news actually becoming bad for equities, uh, where, you know, the reason that the Fed might be cutting, that the reason rates are declining is that demand, not just disinflation, but the demand side and volumes uh, are beginning to decline and decline quickly. Uh, and so there are real genuine implications of those things uh, for corporate earnings. And that is a scenario, despite all the you know high-fiving about potential rate cuts, uh, that we don't see expressed uh, explicitly in the equity market estimates. Lisa, how does that stack up with what you've heard from earnings so far? I know it's super early on with just the big banks behind us and tech coming up next week. But what's the takeaway so far? Yeah, look, I, I think that, um, you know, so far earnings have been mixed at best. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, certainly we've had, to your point, a sector mix issue here that, that you know, has prevented a, a, a material meltdown. But we've had some big names missing and missing on fundamental things like demand, like pricing, like margins. And I think that the more those messages start being communicated, uh, and people wrap their heads around this idea uh, that Q1 uh, 2023 is highly unlikely to be the trough in earnings for many businesses that have economic exposure, which even including mega cap tech is most. Um, I think I think we'll be able to make some progress here in setting realistic expectations. Well, smaller banks have been a feature of that conversation this week. Mike Collins, net interest margins narrower off the back of some of the stress. Clearly, they've got to pay up to retain deposits. I just wonder what you think about the stress as it slowly fades over the last month, Mike. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, this, this deposit issue is, is a big deal. The net interest income and net interest margins are a big deal for the bank. It does hit their profitability. But ultimately, what hurts banks, Jonathan, through a, a credit cycle uh, is the asset side, right, is the, the quality of the loans. And as we've gone through a lot of the bank earnings, certainly the big money center banks, but even some of the bigger kind of super regional banks, um, it's really hard to find a lot of chinks in the armor in terms of their asset quality. Yeah, there are a handful of banks that maybe are over their skis with some you know, commercial real estate, some office exposure, but by and large, the underwriting through this cycle has been really solid, right? And as a credit person, that's really what we hang our hat on. So, so provisions are going up, losses will pick up. A lot of the banks are seeing some increased losses in their credit card consumer portfolios as well, not just on the commercial side. Uh, but ultimately, we don't think it's going to be a big kind of systemic existential issue uh, for the bank. So we're generally buyers of banks on, on weakness. By and large, we've seen a lot of signs that things are stabilizing in the banking sector, with the exception of maybe this. This yesterday from the Federal Reserve, just a read on the latest balance sheet showing that the banking stress may not be over just yet. The Fed's emergency lending rising for the first time in a few weeks. Kelly Lines has more on this. Hey, Kelly. Yeah, for four weeks in a row, John, we saw these borrowings from the Federal Reserve dropping, but they picked back up in the week through Wednesday the 19th. Now, $143.9 billion of loans outstanding from the Fed's two facilities. Of course, the traditional uh, liquidity backs up the discount window, as well as the new uh, bank term uh, funding program, which was introduced, of course, last month after the bank failures. Borrowing from both of those facilities rose from the previous week. So this is an indication that the stresses may have calmed somewhat, but they aren't entirely over yet. And of course, part of that stress, as you were just discussing, does have to do with these deposit outflows. We've been getting clues into the deposit picture over the last week as banks, both big and smaller, have reported. Regions Financial uh, reporting this morning. Interesting to see the stock relatively unchanged earlier, though, in pre-market trading. Uh, it was lower because they did have deposits drop quarter on quarter. They expect in the first half overall deposits will be down between 3 and $5 billion, though they do expect a stabilization and perhaps even modest growth in the second half. So perhaps investors are looking forward uh, to the light at the end of the tunnel. It'll be interesting to see, though, how quickly there is an actual light at the end of the tunnel in terms of a share price recovery, because while for the broader financial sector, we have seen a pretty sharp rebound off the lows from March at one point down nearly 10 percent year to date, now down just two and a half percent year to date. But for those regional banks in particular, 
A rebound has been very hard to find. That sector still remains down by more than a quarter so far in 2023, John. It's a good point, Kaylee. It hasn't recovered in a major way, even as volatility has started to fade. It's not a banking crisis, is what Mohammed Alerian told us last Friday. Brian Moynihan at Bank of America saying precisely the same thing in the last 24 hours to David Weston, the B of A chief, saying it's not a banking crisis. Well, is it a credit crunch? We caught up with Mohammed just yesterday. Take a listen. This is not a credit crunch, this is a credit contraction. And there is a difference. A credit crunch is economy-wide, it has massive implication. A credit contraction has distributional effects. So we should be talking about the distributional effects. Lisa Shannon, your reaction to that, the potential for a credit contraction and what it might mean for this economy going forward from here? Yeah, so we've been very focused uh, on this point and, and understanding the role of which banks uh, the small, medium size, the regional banks, uh, and where their exposures are when we talk about actually contracting credit. Uh, and so we know that they uh, have been the lenders of choice in a post uh, great financial crisis world um, to 70% of the commercial real estate loans, about 48% of commercial uh, and industrial loans, about 38%. Uh, of uh, residential mortgages. So we are looking at the impacts to small and medium-sized businesses. And, you know, we know uh, from some of the surveys we're already getting out of, uh, you know, NIFIB and the small business uh, community that they are feeling it. And, and they are, you know, signaling that in, in terms of the 40-year low uh, in terms of indicating uh, that the this is a good time to invest and expand their businesses. Uh, so th we do think that there are some material and systemic ripples uh, on economic growth that are going to come from this credit contraction. Mike, with that in mind, how resilient do you think credit is going to be? You talked about the lack of leverage relative to what we might have seen in years gone by because of the monster fiscal transfers we saw through the pandemic. I've had people come on this program and say these companies got religion in the pandemic. They didn't do what they typically do as the economy raced away. Mike, how resilient do you think credit's going to be? Yeah, I mean, undoubtedly, uh, as a result of this credit contraction, right, one of the best leading indicators of, of default rates in the high-yield market, Jonathan, is, is lending standards. And you're seeing lending standards tighten across the board, uh, and that's going to lead to higher default rates in the high-yield market. But you're starting, as you said, at really good levels, at really low levels. So we're talking the default rate in the high-yield market going, you know, from 1% to 2% annually to maybe 3 4 or 5 And And remember, the historical average is around 4 And a 4% annual default rate, if that's sustained, and that's probably our base case, that you get defaults picking up, you don't have a big default spike like you've had in some past deep recessions. It's just, you know, higher defaults, more credit problems, credit contraction, as, as I guess we're calling it. And that's priced in, right, with a 450 basis point spread on the high-yield market. That's pricing in about an average default rate of, of 4%. So, so on that measure, you could say the high-yield market is kind of fair value, and that's, that's really our view there. Mike, I think a lot of people might push back with that for you, the idea that some of this is priced in. Typically, when we get a recession, what's the average spread of high yield? Yeah, I mean, I mean, spreads, when default rates go up, Jonathan, uh, spreads go wider, right? So we are being uh, tactical in this regard as well, right? I mean, I think, and we think as a shop, that, that credit spreads will probably, probably should push 100 basis points wider from here before you get excited and start buying them. But if you bought, I think, the high yield asset class today and held it, you know, for five years through the cycle, you're going to earn that excess yield uh, over treasuries, but but it's not cheap, right? And I think it gets cheaper as you go through a weaker part of the credit cycle. There's a, a weaker part of the economic cycle. After a tremendous amount of monetary tightening, um, credit does deteriorate and you do get wider spreads. You get a cheaper entry point, and that's really what we're waiting for. I hear the same thing on the equity side from Lisa as well. Lisa Shannon, Mike Collins, you're both going to be sticking with me. A broader equity market just about turning positive, positive almost 0.1% with some movers going into the open. Here's Abby. John, it may be Friday, but we do still have earnings rolling in, in particular Procter & Gamble. These shares right now are higher after they did beat both top and bottom line estimates. They've also raised the full year view for sales. The profit, though, is staying the same due to, quote unquote, strong headwinds in the form of freight costs and other input costs. As for earnings from yesterday, Tesla had its worst day since January of this year. 
AT&T had been down the most since uh, 2000, down more than 10%, but a little bit of stabilization here. And of course, we have this story out on Tesla, John, that after lowering prices, they're now raising prices. I cannot keep up with that Tesla story. We'll pick up on that story around the opening bell. Abby, thank you. Coming up, President Biden looking to curb investment in China. National security is of paramount importance in our relationship with China. We will not compromise on these concerns even when they force trade-offs with our economic interests. Washington, D.C. flagging security concerns. Beijing saying otherwise. That conversation just around a corner. Plus, the President of the United States gearing up for another run. Tesla is a unique uh, because when they found it uh, and then the personality behind it, uh, the product is beautiful, technologically uh, very, very strong. So in many areas, Tesla is Tesla, um, but x is x -Pen. We want to focus on what we think is important for our customers. Our customer like beautifully designed vehicles, either it's large SUV or sports sedan. We believe we have a very, very appealing uh, family look that our customers is really attracted to. Uh, they like to have user-friendly features inside the cabin that has a technology feel. It's very smart. It enables them to really utilize the vehicle that's different. National security is of paramount importance in our relationship with China. Even though these policies may have economic impacts, they are driven by straightforward national security considerations. And we will not compromise on these concerns even when they force trade-offs with our economic interests. It's security before the economy. That's the message from Secretary Yellen. President Biden echoing that sentiment, preparing an executive order limiting U.S. investments in China. A spokesperson for the foreign ministry accusing the U.S. of trying to choke its economy, calling the move from Washington, quote, pure economic coercion. The latest push coming as the president has a second lost. term, gearing up to formally launch his re-election campaign, perhaps as early as next week. Your team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie down in Washington alongside Enda Curran. MH, first to you, this push, this announcement. Next week... Potentially, nothing set in stone yet. They're still working on it, but it could be as soon as next week. Some reports are saying Tuesday. Uh, potentially, this would be the anniversary of when Biden uh, first announced uh, his uh, idea, bid to seek higher office. Um, so he has been talking about Jonathan the past few weeks and months, him, members of his family, and those very close to him in the White House have been saying the president does intend to run. But clearly, there's some pressure on Biden and the Biden world to really make sure he comes out and says specifically, I plan to run and these are the steps I'm going to take. Now, it remains to be seen if this means he's going to start to file with the Federal Election Commission, that, that paperwork, but it does look like this would come in the form of a video, not a huge campaign event. So for now, Jonathan, how I view this as a soft launch of his bid into 2024, but certainly getting the process going. And let's talk some hard policy. The president preparing reportedly 
an executive order to li limit U.S. investments in China. Enda, can you tell me what U.S. investments in China and whether allies are going to be on board with this? Well, it's all a sensitive technology. It's AI, it's quantum, it's the high-tech areas that the U.S. is concerned that China might use for dual use in particular, John. So there is expected to be an executive order coming out of the White House. We also had the comments from Janet Yellen, of course, making the point that the U.S. is willing to take a hit uh, when it comes to national security over, over the economy. But whether or not the broader G7 is on board remains to be seen. We know there's already been some fracturing of the messaging from there, in particular coming from France. Japan broadly seems to be on board, but the, the broader narrative on China is not yet aligned. China, of course, pushing back overnight, comments from Beijing making it clear that they view this as economic coercion and that the U.S. is trying to block their own economic development. Well, there's a much more direct, specific question, Anne-Marie. Is Macron on board? Well, listen, the president had a phone call with President Macron yesterday, which stated the two do seem aligned when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, when it comes to China, as well as when it comes to making sure there is a peaceful, independent Taiwan Strait. But, of course, this phone call happened after Emmanuel Macron went to Beijing, almost endorsed, really, China in their effort to try to, quote, unquote, have this peace plan, even though Xi Jinping has not even called Zelensky, but did make a physical trip in person to see Putin in Moscow. Um, and then, of course, when he left, he gave this interview. And what was so telling about this interview, besides the fact that he said he doesn't want to decouple from China, he doesn't want to become a vassal in U.S. versus China, and he wants strategic autonomy for Europe, uh, Politico had to say that there was even more frank comments about Taiwan that they weren't able to print. That's the policy conversation going into the weekend. Anne-Marie and the two of the best down in Washington, thank you. Just a headline coming from Deloitte, very small slice of the overall workforce, but Deloitte to cut 1,200 jobs in the U.S. That's 1,200 jobs in the United States, according to the Financial Times. Add it to the list. It's a long list, isn't it? A lot of job cuts coming from a lot of big companies. Back with us for a final word, Lisa Shallot, Mike Collins. Lisa, I wanted to fit this in. You've called this a dangerous phase for markets. Can you explain to our audience what you think is dangerous about it? Well, look, I, I think that this is a market, as we've talked about, that I think has been extraordinarily glass half full. Um, so there's been a willingness to embrace the view that the Fed has navigated into soft landing, that they will immediately move to rate cuts, that those rate cuts um, are simply a cost of capital uh, a signal as opposed to, and a signal that inflation has been tamed, as opposed to a signal that there's economic weakening. And so I think that there's this, this potential that, you know, multiples have expanded on falling earnings. Um, and that we get into this scenario where things actually are weak. And that's why the bond market is pricing the way it's pricing and why yield curves are inverted. Uh, and, uh, you know, stock investors have to cope with the fact that multiples may contract at the same time uh, that earnings begin to fall. And, that, and that's a very kind of dangerous combination. Mike Collins, final word. Yeah, there are certainly, Jonathan, a lot of worrisome uh, leading indicators. I mean, all of the typical pre-recessionary cyclical factors are, are in play here. And then, then you can add on geopolitical risk, as we were just talking about with China. But you can, you can kind of really uh, write that larger around the world. Our view is you're going to just have heightened geopolitical concerns on top of the cyclical indicators. Investors that are ignoring these signs do so at their own peril, right? I mean, there's a good chance that we do have a harder landing than our base case. Mike Collins of PJ, thank you, sir. Alongside the brilliant Lisa Shallot of Morgan Stanley, you're both brilliant, just in case someone feels bad about that. In your equity market right now, futures positive about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Coming up, the morning calls in later, bracing for bad news. How Canaccord's Tony Dwyer is preparing to take advantage of any weakness in this market. That conversation coming up shortly. There is so much doom and gloom out there. We've all been waiting for the same weakness. But this equity market has recovered pretty nicely off the back of the banking stress of a month or so ago. Futures just about positive, 0.1% on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields bleeding just a little bit lower by four or five basis points. Your two-year, north of 4% through the whole of this week.
maybe I should go do something else. I can't do anything better than I'm already doing. I've already turned this company around. I've made a lot of money for the investors, the shareholders, and yourself. Are you happy doing this? You're going to do this for the foreseeable future? I, I'm going to do it for the foreseeable future. I love what I do, and the reality is we've accomplished a lot. As you described, we've made Blackstone a lot of money. We've made our shareholders a lot of money. More importantly, we've grown the business, and we've been a huge engine of opportunity. If you think about all the jobs we've created around the world, all the communities we've made better places, all the ownership groups who we've helped uh, grow their business, and, and having built a world-class culture, you know, the opportunities we've created for upward mobility for people. And this business, I would still say, is like a coiled spring coming out of COVID particularly. So I feel like we just have more to do. I'm, you know, my, job, my job's n n far from done. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets, trying to open. This is Bloomberg Technology. And welcome to Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. couple of days without gains on the S&P 500. Will we make it three on the S&P? Trying to avoid that right now. Just about positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Still down on the week through Thursday. Just a touch. In the bond market, the two-year yield above 4% through the whole of this week. On a weekly range, just at the very, very low end of that range right now, at about 4.1%. On a US two year yields coming back in about four basis points. That's the price action. Let's get to some morning calls for you. HSBC upgrading ATT to buy, seeing opportunities after earnings led to the biggest sell off in 23 years. That stock is down 1.3%. Morgan Stanley down grading Seagate to equal weight, expecting another few quarters of weak demand after the company's earnings call. We're down there 1.6%. And your third and final call from Truist. The team there downgrading Tesla to hold, saying lower pricing and margins diminish the value of its core business. That stock got hammered yesterday, trying to bounce this morning. Coming up, earnings season ramping up. Big tech results next week. That conversation shortly with Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Gemity. I think we've moved from this attitude from it's an indulgence, a waste of time, almost an illness that needs a cure. For something as universally important to human life as sleep, mysteries surrounding its necessity and utility have only just been recently uncovered. Some of our biggest discoveries were in the 1970s or 1980s, and so it makes it a really exciting field because it seems as though we're uncovering new insights each and every day. Some scientists are going further to find out how sleep and what happens there can be harnessed to further expand our understanding. It's easy to memorize things. That makes you smart if you can spit back a lot of facts. But if you want to be wise, if you really want wisdom, you've got to know when and how and why to use that information. And that's what your brain figures out while you're sleeping. <laughs> Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. 
what do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. On the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations, I uncover the untold stories of the world's most successful leaders. Watch Wednesdays on Bloomberg Television. Three seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning. Looking to get you to the weekend. The quiet period for the Federal Reserve begins tomorrow. Just a tiny bit more Fed speak a little bit later. Going into all of that, equities just about unchanged into the opening bow. We're positive by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, negative 0.1%. There's your opening bow. Switch to the board and get to the bond market. Yields lower yesterday. Lower again today. We're down by two basis points. Just in and around 350 on a 10-year maturity. 350.72 is the yield on a 10-year yield right now. Off the back of weaker than expected data just yesterday, jobless claims a bit higher than expected. Is there a trend there in the FX market? Decent data out of Europe. We'll catch up with Maria Tadeo out of Europe a little bit later this morning in about 15 minutes or so. PMI solid on the services side. Euro dollar still south of 110 after breaking that level last week. 110.76 this time last week. Intraday high for the year right now, 109.84. And crude positive 1%. Still below 80, $78 and about 20 cents. 40 seconds into the session, your equity market looks a little something like this on the S&P, on the NASDAQ, on the S&P, totally unchanged. On the NASDAQ, we're down by 0.1%. One stock to watch at the open, Regions Financial, rounding out this week's bank earnings with a miss on profits, but deposits coming in line with expectations. The company saying this, consistent with expectations, total deposits declined approximately 2%, but importantly, Deposits remain stable from earlier in March through the end of the quarter. Charlie Bassett, that's been a theme this week for these banks. Yeah, you have whiplash, John, so do I. Because at the beginning of the week, stability was enough to hold these banks higher after huge sell-offs. But you're seeing from Regions Financial that pressure on profit, even after net interest income beat expectations, charge-offs higher, loan losses higher, loan loss provisioning, uh, efficiency higher. And you're starting to see a company like Regions Financial, which does see stabilization in deposits, a little bit of attrition in deposits through the end of the year it expects but nothing crazy the stock is not reacting well to the information it has even if it's lending a little harder again for the last kind of 24 hours or so we saw very similar movements across the banking system you see it right there just check out year to date zion's financial first republic down 89 percent on the year ahead of earnings on monday that's the one that everyone is set to watch really uh, until we hear from first republic we won't get a greater sense of the stability of of the mid to regional banking system, that one is the whale in the room. It's not over yet, Shanali, thank you, and fantastic coverage this week. Thanks for all your hard work, as always, this earnings season on some of the big banks. The focus also, of course, on the small banks, so extra work for Shanali. We've got First Republic on Monday, and full coverage will take place on this program, of course. We'll turn to tech next week as well. After multiple price cuts, Tesla reversing course, increasing U.S. prices on select models after quarterly results sparked the stock's biggest, biggest decline since January. Abby, this stock all over the place. It certainly is, and this is a bit of a head-scratcher, but if we back up, because, of course, coming into the year, there was the pressure for the company to make the 1.8 million uh, vehicles delivered uh, in order to spur demand, Elon Musk made the decision to cut prices. And as you mentioned several times, well, that comes out of price because while in the first quarter they did put up 424,000 cars delivered a record, it came at a price on the gross margins coming in below 20%, uh, uh, down by about 200 bips. That caused the stock yesterday to have its worst day since January 3rd. That was basically that big selling pressure we saw, down more than 10% yesterday. So today, so today we come out with the news that they are actually raising the prices on two different models, specifically the S and the X, and also the Plaid versions of both of those. Now, these price increases ever so slight, between four, three to 4,000, so it's more about optics, and I think, John, more than anything, uh, this really lends us some sort of view into the head, perhaps, of CEO Elon Musk, and that everything's an experiment. If this works, then perhaps they'll continue in this trajectory. If not, maybe go down, but not a big move, more about the optics. Well, it didn't work yesterday. Yesterday, stock's still flying, but yesterday took a hammering. Abby, thanks.
thanks for that. That's the latest on Tesla. I want to stick with it. We saw a couple of price target downgrades, some price target cuts, some downgrades too. This came from Truist. I mentioned this about 10 minutes ago. Let's review it together. Here's the quote from them. What surprised us is Tesla's willingness to reduce prices further, accepting lower margins to deepen its ability to generate revenue from AI projects. This approach diminishes the value of its core business. We downgrade to hold. Yesterday, the stock had some difficulty. Right now, in the last couple of seconds, we just turned negative by about 0.1% on that name. I want to look elsewhere at some job cuts. Important to stay on top of all of this. Amazon's Whole Foods planning to slash hundreds of jobs and shrink its operating regions as well. Kaylee Lines back with us with more. Hey, Kaylee. Well, John, as we have so often seen, when a company makes efforts toward cutting costs, we see a pretty positive share reaction. That's definitely taking place this morning with Amazon up more than 2% here at the opening bell. In terms of those operating regions, they will go from nine down to six. And for the overall headcount, it's only gonna be reduced by about half of 1%, and it's not going to affect employees in grocery stores or distribution centers. So when viewed in isolation, it may seem like a relatively small reduction, but of course we have to put this in the wider context of the headcount reduction efforts Amazon already has underway. Of course, as we all know, this was a company that expanded rapidly during the pandemic, brought on more than 700,000 employees and now realizes it overhired, which is why we have already seen the company undertake thousands of job cuts. And the CEO, Andy Jassy, last month said about 9,000 more will be coming in the coming weeks. All told, the company expects to at least 27,000 people will be laid off, but still we have to compare that to the headcount expanding in the hundreds of thousands over just a couple of years. So it is a relatively small slice. We, of course, have seen even larger slices for some of these other tech companies, but what they all have in common, John, is the fact that they expanded their workforces dramatically during the boom times of the COVID years. It is not boom time anymore, and they have to adjust. Earnings next week coming up April 27th on Amazon. Kelly, thank you for that, by the way. Amazon has just made some incremental moves when it comes to job cuts. Compare that to Meta, which has just really hacked away and taken some big chunks out of the workforce in the last few months. Those stories develop a little bit more, no doubt, next week too. The broader market right now, about six minutes into the session, not even positive, 0.1%. Totally unchanged on the S&P 500. On the NASDAQ, we are negative by 0.1%. Can, of course, Tony Dwyer laying out his recession playbook, saying this, stay lighter in exposure, slightly defensive in sector allocation, and stand ready to take advantage of any weakness even when bad news becomes bad news tony joins us right now for more tony here's your take i wrote it down be relieved but don't get comfortable tony what does that mean so if it's a duck john it's a duck <laughs> so you know i i know we're in this great debate about whether there's going to be a recession or not but let me just give you kind of from that note that we talked about um, the yield curves, the percentage of possible U.S. Treasury yield curves that are inverted is 86%. So there's no financial institution. Remember, a lot of the lending takes place away from the banks. So it's not just the traditional yield curves that the Fed looks at that determines who's going to loan and at what level. So if you look at all the possible yield curves, 86% of them are currently inverted. Lending standards have never been at this level without being in a recession or right near one. Leading economic indicators never been at this level without being just before in a recession. Employment Trends Index, same thing. Philly Fed, same thing, which has a 0.92 correlation to the ISM manufacturing. So ultimately, John, you know, you don't go from great growth to deep recession on a tick. You go, you progress through it. Of course, you start with a rolling recession, then you start with a mild recession. The issue is that money has largely shut down. We saw that in the lending data at the end of March, and, and we've got to work our way through that until we get that bad news is bad news and have that opportunity to buy. Tony, that's been a theme for us all this week. This is a process, not a one-off event, a process, yep. the beginning of a process. And Tony, I know from speaking to you for years, it always comes down, nearly always comes down to credit availability for you. And from here, yep. you've got to make an assessment. Does it get better or worse? Are you suggesting it ultimately gets worse? Well, forget my opinion. It is getting worse. I, you know, I don't have to guess. They've released the data. You had the worst two weeks in the history on a two-week basis, two-week drop at the end of March, the last two weeks of March were the worst for commercial lending and leases at commercial banks. So I, I don't have to guess um, what we got. So, John, I think the thing that we really have to focus on here is what gets us out of this 
decline in economic output. So far, we keep getting, you know, whichever one that you guys covered earlier that's laying off X percentage of their workforce. Have you seen anybody adding to their workforce lately? So what creates that environment where you have a, an, an improved outlook for money? I always get the question, why does the market bottom in a recession when you know that that is getting worse? And the answer is because the Fed is cutting rates enough to steepen the yield curve enough, to incent lending enough to be able to look through the coming week data because you know it's going to get better. And we're still not at that point. The Fed is still raising rates. Lending standards are still tightening. And that credit availability is still diminishing. And therein lies the risk in the most levered system we've had. Your conclusion, insufficient reason to look through the weakness. Insufficient reason to look through the economic weakness. Now, many people are inclined to try and look through that economic weakness. You know the S&P's rallied post-SVB. I think we've rallied 7 or 8% off the post-SVB low in the middle of March, Tony. Yep. I'm trying to work out what's defensive in the environment that you describe. What is defensive sure. at the moment? Is it tech still? Is it something else? So, so Jen, I, first I want to clear something up. And it, even in big market declines, you get big bounce backs. I don't know if you remember, the, I think I was on right afterwards, when SVB failed and the, and the BKX, the KBW Bank Stock Index, dropped 12% over three days, it kicked off the signal, which we wrote about in, in a piece called Bounce Then Trounce. The median gain off of that kind of drop in the BKX, a three-day drop of 12%, is 8.8%. So the bounce we've seen is literally exactly what happens every time. And then you go back to the low because it's the psychology of it. The psychology of it is, oh my God, the system's gonna fail, you get smoked. Then all of a sudden you get comfortable, you, you get relieved, right? That's part of the, the title of the note, be relieved. You get relieved because the whole system didn't fail and that's great, but it was never about system failure. It's about the impact on money availability. And that brings us back to the low once we've had that bounce. And I think that's the yep. zone we're coming into. That's so funny. defensive could be utilities, it could be um, staples. It, it, I don't think it's mega cap tech at this point. Well, I said it earlier this week, surviving is not thriving. There is a difference between the two. You mentioned mega cap tech. Let's go through the calendar together. Next week, Microsoft April 25th, Google April 25th, Amazon on the 27th, early May Apple on May the 4th. Tony, of those names in that sector right now, for years, we talked about secular tailwinds. And a theme that comes up from the more bearish individuals that come on the program with me, they often suggest that these names are more cyclical than meets the eye. And Tony, one thing that I reflected on earlier this morning, and we brought it up as well with one of our guests, is that the pandemic was never truly a cyclical test for these names. It wasn't a cyclical test at all because of the massive fiscal transfers that we had through the pandemic. Tony, in their current thought, these mega cap tech names, can you think of the last time they truly had a cyclical test? Yeah, in the end of November of 2021, when they got overvalued. Last. John, the idea that these names are not going to have, um, are going to be subject to enterprise decline if you actually have um, a, a drop in a real negative period of economic activity. But let, let's put some data to it, right? You're back to 29, the top 10 stocks of the S&P 500 now, according to my friends at Ned Davis, account for about um, 29, almost 30% of the S&P 500. So that, that's almost, it's higher than it was uh, right before dot com and almost as high as it was at the peak in November 2021. But here's, here's the point that I want to really reinforce. The Russell 2000 relative to the S&P 500 is back to where it was at the, just right around the low week in March of 2020. That's how significantly the mega cap stocks have outperformed relative to small cap stocks. So now is not the time to all of a sudden chase them because they're acting great. Um, to me, if anything, as we go lower, it could be like a later 02 and into early 03 low or a later 08 into early 09 low, where the broad market starts to act a little bit better than the index. And that's going to be the sign I'm going to be looking for to attack the low. And again, we're 15 months into this. This is not new news. Nothing I'm saying is outside of what we've already, you've done a great job already talking about this morning. So my point of being what I call light and tight, light and exposure, kind of tight to the benchmarks, maybe a little defensive. I want to be in a position to attack a whoosh. You know, that's my technical term. So when bad news becomes bad news and the you start to really impact the market, 
if you're too negative going in 15 months in, you're not able, I'm not able to really be aggressive. I want to be aggressive, but it's got to come with some meaningful realization that we're going into recession. If it looks like a duck, it is quacking like a duck. It's light, a duck. Light and tight. I said this to you last time. It sounds like a summer diet, Tony. Got to find a new well, phrase. Tony, appreciate what it. What do we always. do? We market on Wall Street, right? So True. Blatant. Tony, can I just say, I always enjoy listening to you work through some of these issues. With the utmost respect, appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Tony Dwyer of Canaccord, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. 13 or 14 minutes into this session, it's a bit of a snoozer. I've got to say, the price action really not doing much going into the weekend. Totally unchanged on the S&P 500. The data is interesting, though. In just a few moments, we'll get US PMIs. Eurozone economic growth is picking up. We need really to look at the data as they can. I mean, we live in a very high uncertain times. We have to be, I think, cautious. That conversation, next. world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on-demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It was unimaginable that we would see rates move this fast. That was not in the realm of thinking. Just the timeline of what they knew and when they knew it. Why didn't they do anything about it? When do we have to see the kill? <laughs> it's always for the Fed to respond to it. And this is really the tension. Be informed. You cannot be overly data dependent. You've got to have a view of where you're going. Be prepared. I think the earnings season might actually be the positive surprise that people are not expecting. Be ahead of the game. It's only the beginning of something, something we need to keep an eye on. And that, I think, is really going to be an interesting takeaway from this moment. You go all birds on us, and you say, turn, turn, turn. Is that what we're doing right now? Yeah, big question coming into the show for us was, when is that turn going to be? What a fantastic conversation. The news you need. The president's calling on manufacturers to make more in America. It is working, and it's reflected in these jobs numbers. The analysis you trust. How do you take this anecdotal data and say, really, just focus on the now, because that is going to tell you where we're going? What is the measurement of uncertainty that we have in studying the American economy? Milton Friedman had said there are long and variable lags in the impact of monetary policy. But man, it's a long slog. The best way to start your day. People are tuning into this program on a daily basis. Oh, I come on. It makes for good TV. Let's move on. Bloomberg Surveillance. Weekdays from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Bloomberg UK, your source for news and analysis covering the biggest challenges facing the UK government, economy, financial services, and markets. Tax cuts should not be the priority. It's about a credible plan for growth over the next two, three years. In this post-Brexit world, how do you see actually servicing your clients? It was disruptive, and it's going to have implications to how capital raising works. Now we're having the perfect storm in the UK. Watch Francine Lacqua, Thursdays at 9.30 a.m., only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. the data as they can. I mean, we live in a very high uncertain times, and therefore it is not obvious really to understand all the trends. We have to look at them one by one carefully. We have to be, I think, cautious. It does not mean that we uh, stop or... It means that we decide meeting by meeting on the basis of the information that we get. We can look at the data 
right now, the Eurozone economic rebound gaining momentum. April PMIs showing resurgent service sector activity. US PMIs just crossing the wires right now. Let's get you the team coverage. Maria Tadeo in Brussels, Ed Harrison in DC. Ed, better than expected and waking this bond market up just a little bit. Yeah, uh, very, uh, very good data. Not as good as in Europe, but definitely better than expected. And I think in particular, when we look at the manufacturing, it was expected to be at a 49 handle, which is contracting. It was above 50. So I think in general, what it's saying is, is that the economy is more resilient than uh, we anticipated. And in particular, the services sector, which is the larger component of all these, uh, these economies, is doing well, both in Europe and in the United States. 50, the divided line between expansion and contraction, 53.7 on the services PMI, the previous read, 52.6. Ed, just a word on jobless claims, if you can. Jobless claims, I think, speak yeah. people in the other direction. Claims kind of breaking out over the last couple of weeks, yields lower. Yields have bounced on this print, I know, but Ed, just a final word on claims, please. Yeah, I think that uh, what claims are telling us is, is that we're not out of the woods yet, that uh, what we're seeing uh, relative to a year ago, relative to six months ago, is that claims are coming up, both in terms of initial claims and in terms of continuing claims. So what it says here is that the U.S. economy is slowing. The question is, is what's the pace of that slowing? And uh, is it going to have extra oomph as a result of the credit crisis and also potentially a debt ceiling crisis? Just to recap that data for you, as Ed pointed out, manufacturing with a 50 handle. We were looking for something with a 49 handle. Again, that dividing line between expansion and contraction, 50. Manufacturing coming in at 50.4. Services PMI at 53.7. The composite PMI for the month of April, a preliminary reading coming in at 53.5. The estimate 51.2. Previous read, 52.3. Maria Tadeo, I have to say, the services story in Europe looking pretty decent. Uh, it is, Jonathan. And look, when you look at the PMIs for April, it was a beat and would also suggest there is, in fact, momentum in the European economy going into Q2. But you talked about the services. The issue here is that when you look at the details, and this is where it gets cloudy and it's difficult uh, to read, yes, the overall number is good. Yes, services, in fact, are gaining momentum and expanding. But when you look at the manufacturing in the euro area, it is in contraction. Now, the question is, what matters most, the manufacturing sector or the services and it really depends who you ask but also the type of economy that you run if you're a big industrial country like germany obviously it's not good news if you're a service-led economy probably also means that you're adding jobs the issue here is that for the european central bank the fact that there is this growing divergence it makes policy more difficult now we know that there is a decision coming up in about two weeks on may 4th this is a central bank that has said we're going to be now meeting by meeting very data dependent but there isn't a single trend and that is exactly what the head of the Italian Central Bank, Bank Italia, that you played at the top of the show, alluded to. There isn't a single trend. What is clear, though, however, when you look at the different voices at the governing council, is that they will most likely hike again in May. The debate, and this goes back to the data, is the magnitude of this hike. Also considering, by the way, Jonathan, that this is the fastest hiking cycle on record for the European Central Bank already. A much faster much quicker, much higher than anyone anticipated, including myself. I had no idea how far the ECB would go. I struggled to think that we're going to get past zero when we were in the depths of the pandemic. Just a final word on the Bank of Italy, Governor. Speaking to Francine Lacqua, great exchange, really good conversation about a meeting-by-meeting -meeting approach to ECB policy. You can find that in full on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. Maria went through the dates. May 4th for the ECB, Ed Harrison May 3rd for the Federal Reserve. It's the final day of Fed speak, Ed. Your wrap of what you've heard so far this week, to me at least, Ed, a lot of these guys are on the same page. Yeah, I think that the page they're on is that we're going to hike one more time, and then we're going to be done, and we're going to keep it at a high level, at that, that, that plateau for a long time, until we see inflation, you know, near 2%. Or, so the, the bar for the, the Fed to actually cut is incredibly high, especially when you see data coming in like this. So what it says is you have to see the inflation come way down. We're talking with a two-handle, you know, somewhere around 3%. 
Uh, and we also need to see some sort of uh, weakening in the economy, se severe weakening. So all of the cuts that are priced into the market, Fed funds futures, they're going to have to be priced out over time because what we're seeing now is the economy can withstand what the Fed's dished out over the last year, yep. and, and therefore we're going to keep it that high plateau. I'd appreciate your time, mate, as always. Ed Harrison there and Maria Tadeo out of Europe and out of Washington as well. This bond market's flipped. Yields were lower, now they're higher. Off the back of those US PMIs, yields are up by four basis points on a two-year, just below 420. That's a turnaround in the last 10 minutes. Up next, your trading diary. gigantic market values and they're very prominent in China, not as prominent outside of China as obviously in China and certainly not that prominent in the United States. TikTok, by contrast, is not in China, but it's gigantic outside of China, of the United States and everywhere. What did TikTok do that enabled a Chinese-based company, parent company at least, to do so well outside of China? We think it's challenging to build a global company uh, in general, but the best ones we have seen so far are ones that take very consistent global learnings and adapt them to the local to, to the local to the local countries that they are operating in. So you need to be global and local at the same time. Why do the biggest names in business choose Bloomberg? That is a great question. It's a great question. Great question. Great question. Best question I get all night. Bloomberg. Top experts. Great questions. The economic data better than expected. 25 minutes into the session, call it 26. The Nasdaq lower, yields higher. We're down four tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq, down about a tenth of one percent on the S&P 500. Equity softer. Let's get to the trading diary. 2:15 Eastern time. You'll hear from President Biden, Fed Governor Lisa Cook on tap ahead of the Fed's quiet period. Looking to next week, more earnings on deck. First Republic on Monday, Alphabet, Microsoft Tuesday, Meta on Wednesday, then on Thursday, Amazon and Intel, and we round out the week with US GDP. From New York City, that does it for me. Enjoy the weekend. This was the Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg. Tesla is a unique uh, because when they found it uh, and then the personality behind it, 
Mm. Uh, the product is beautiful, technologically uh, very, very strong. So in many areas, Tesla is Tesla, um, but XPEN is XPEN. We want to focus on what we think is important for our customers. Our customer like beautifully designed vehicles, either it's large SUV or sports sedan. We believe we have a very, very appealing uh, family look that our customers is really attracted to. Uh, uh, they like to have user-friendly features inside the cabin that has a technology feel. It's very smart. It enables them to really utilize the vehicle that's different. People ask me all the time, what is the key to being a really good investor? And I tell them, it's to surround yourself with and work with the best investors you can find. On Bloomberg Wealth, I'm going to take you to meet the greatest investors in the world, the people that I would like to have managing my money. While I like home runs and grand slams in baseball, at A-Rod Corp here, we shoot for singles and doubles, and we definitely never want to strike out. In a multi-trillion dollar industry, there's a lot of ground to cover. We indeed have a rally. We're talking a lot of dividends. We're talking income. We'll show you what's happening in ETFs like no one else. Bloomberg ETF IQ, Monday on Bloomberg. Pepsi's number fever campaign in the Philippines has probably winning caps than they planned. The resulting chaos caused riots, civil unrest, and even deaths. Reporting this story took over a year, and it resulted in me flying uh, to Manila in the Philippines to meet unlucky winners and to find out exactly what happened back then in the 1990s. My name is Jeff Maish. I'm a journalist based in Los Angeles. I wrote the story for Bloomberg Businessweek about Pepsi's number fever campaign. The Philippines is a really interesting country. It's made up of thousands of islands. And it's also a country that's very heavily influenced by America. American culture is everywhere you look in the Philippines. They're obsessed with Frank Sinatra music, for example. They love all things America, and that extends to their, their love for soft drinks, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola. In the 1990s, it was everywhere. Pepsi and Coca-Cola were embroiled in what is now known as the Cola Wars. It was a fierce battle for market dominance. Number Fever was already a really popular promotion. It had been rolled out in America to great success. And so Pepsi decided to roll it out internationally, particularly in Asia. They thought it was the answer to their problems. They thought it could finally help them beat their biggest competitor. <laughs> A million pesos, or $68,000, doesn't sound like a lot now. But in 1992, that was a phenomenal amount of money. You've got to remember that in the Philippines at the time, the average monthly income was about $100. So a million pesos was wealth beyond anyone's wildest imaginations. Number fever caught fire in the Philippines. Kids were saving up their pocket money to buy a bottle of Pepsi. Parents were squirreling away all of the bottle caps in bags. You would walk down the street and people were going through trash trying to find discarded bottle caps. It was a national phenomenon. Pepsi boasted that half the population of the Philippines was playing it. Number Fever boosted Pepsi's sales every month from $10 million to $14 million. It had a huge impact on Pepsi's bottom line. Number fever quickly became number hysteria. Maids were being jailed for stealing their employers' winning bottle caps. 
There was even some murders uh, over, over winning bottle caps. People were fighting in the streets uh, over these caps. There were signs that there were going to be problems with number fever very early. Pepsi had rolled out the competition in Chile and a garbled fax had caused some kind of problem with the winning number. They'd announced the wrong one in Chile, causing riots. There were signs that there could be big problems ahead if they didn't keep their eye on the ball. So in 1992, Pepsi decided to extend the campaign in the Philippines and they announced that the competition would go on for a few more weeks. One night, on the television news, they announced the latest winning number, 349. The problem was, 349 had already been allocated as a non-winning number in earlier campaigns. So there were literally hundreds of thousands of bottle caps with 349 just floating around the Philippines. Hundreds of thousands of people all across the Philippines, thousands of islands, were finding winning bottle caps. 349, 349. Some people had 10 lucky 349 bottle caps. People were dancing in the street, celebrating. They thought their problems were over. They were millionaires. It's still not certain exactly how many winners there were of lucky 349 bottle caps, but we know that Pepsi printed over 600,000 of them. Pepsi realized very early that there was a problem. Hundreds of people started arriving at their bottling plants with their lucky bottle caps. They realized something was seriously wrong. Pepsi tried to solve the problem by offering a small token donation to anyone that brought a lucky bottle cap to their bottling plant. But it wasn't enough. People didn't want just a handful of pesos. People wanted their million peso prize. Within a year, violent protests and riots outside Pepsi factories would leave dozens injured and five people dead. At one Pepsi factory in the Philippines, a grenade was thrown through the window. It killed three Pepsi employees. Anacita Rosario was a school teacher living near Manila in the Philippines. She was one of the tragic victims of this whole thing. She was walking to a nearby store to buy some rice one day when a Molotov cocktail was thrown at a Pepsi truck in a, in a violent protest. It bounced under the truck and exploded. It killed her and an innocent bystander who was just a child and injured many others. When I was in the Philippines, I tracked down Anasita's daughter, Cindy, and her husband, Raul. It was clear to me that they were still very upset by the whole thing. You know, a family had been ripped apart by this competition. And Raul told me that he'd never remarried. He'd uh, told me that he'd gone to meet Pepsi executives after his wife was killed. And he was angry. He, he said to them, you know, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for number fever. The biggest revelation from my reporting was rumors that Pepsi was somehow involved in bombing their own trucks. I found a newspaper report with a headline that said, Pepsi goons bomb their own trucks. And when I visited the MBI, the police uh, department in, in the Philippines, they presented me with documents and interviews with people who claimed that Pepsi had paid them to cause riots and to cause trouble outside their plants in order to destabilize the situation and to frame the owners of the coalitions uh, that, were, that were fighting them to try and curry favor. I just thought that was, that was so shocking. And of course, Pepsi denied it, but how bizarre that a company would be accused of bombing their own trucks. The contest had sparked so much anger in the Philippines because it landed at just this really weird time in the Philippines' history. It was during a crazy election that was racked with allegations of fraud. The Philippines was in a kind of love-hate relationship with America. They loved, obviously, the American aid and finances that was pouring into the country. 
But at the same time, they yearned for independence. They wanted to be their own country. Vicente del Fierro was a local preacher living in Manila, and he hated the number fever campaign. Del Fierro thought Pepsi's number fever campaign was just one of the many ways that America was asserting its dominance over a third world country. He hated seeing his fellow countrymen get ripped off in his eyes by this huge multinational American company. He wanted justice. Del Fierro rounded up over 800 winners of 349 bottle caps, and he got them all together to sue Pepsi for over $400 million to be divided between those holders of lucky bottle caps. Del Fierro took money from some of the people who could afford it. They paid him 500 pesos to help with legal fees, but for people who couldn't afford the, the money, he would just represent them pro bono. The alliance they say is to build the pressure on Pepsi and so you see people uh, marching in the streets. Mm -hmm. So um, we have mounted our own uh, campaign even in the U.S. Even in the U.S. He flew to America and he hired two uh, consumer lawyers uh, here in America to take on Pepsi. He had a meeting at Pepsi's headquarters to try and resolve the problem, but he said he wanted to take it all the way to the highest courts in America. When those cases were heard in America, those courts decided that this was a problem that should be heard in the Philippines, not in America. Back in the Philippines, Del Fierro continued his case in the Filipino courts. At one stage, there were arrest warrants handed out for nine Pepsi-Cola executives, which he saw as a big victory. We don't know if those arrest warrants were ever upheld, but it made newspaper headlines across the country. Pepsi did not take kindly to Del Fierro's campaign. They tried everything to shut him down. They sued him for libel. My father had to attend three times a month for a branch 145, and another hearing for the branch 138, also three times a month. Also, um, there was a time uh, my father was hospital due to heart failure. Still, he had to attend the two branch hearing otherwise. Uh, for not attending, the judge will issue a warrant of arrest to my father. Uh, my father uh, passed away January 13, 2010, after staying for almost one year in the hospital. He died of complication due to heart failure. After the death of my father, I was inspired to do the website. Pepsico will be remembered for what they did to the consumer in the Philippines and to my father. When I reached out to Pepsi for comment for this story, they claimed that they didn't have access to anyone who was working at Pepsi that was around in those days. They also said that during COVID-19, they didn't have access to their, their documents about this, but you know, they were, very, they were very careful to say that they were sorry for everything that happened. And we do know that Pepsi did try everything to try and make this right. The Pepsi number fever disaster cost the company millions. We know that they paid up to $10 million in those goodwill payments. But the financial effect could be much greater. After the disaster, we know that Pepsi sales dipped. They were overtaken by Coca-Cola again. Pepsi's number fever disaster changed the legacy of that soft drink in the Philippines forever. Some people of a certain age won't touch it. For many people, Pepsi is a taboo word. A lot of the people that I spoke to were still quite traumatized by their experience, by that experience of winning a million pesos, losing it, and then returning to their normal life in poverty in Manila.
When the news of the bombing came out, it was a massive story in Germany. We are following some breaking news coming to us out of Dortmund in Germany. It was covered by all the media outlets. Three roadside explosions triggered at the same time last night as a coach left its hotel in the south of Dortmund. Public figures commented on it. We should not let them affect our, our life, whoever it was. The media echo went far beyond Dortmund. I think it was front page news in every single big paper around Europe. Everyone thought of like a terrorist attack and people were scared that throughout the city in Dortmund there was more attacks to be happening. Unbeknownst to investigators, just after the bomb went off and the, the players of the team were shell-shocked, the person who had masterminded the attack was actually sitting in the hotel eating uh, steak and sweet potatoes. My name is Thomas Rogers. I'm the journalist who wrote the article, The Get Rich Quick Scheme That Nearly Killed a German Soccer Team. Dortmund is a mid-sized city in the western part of Germany in a state called North Rhine-Westphalia. And it's a former industrial city that's kind of fallen on hard times in the last few decades. It was severely bombed in the war. So the center of the city is quite stark. Some of the few high points include its soccer team. My name is Ike Henning. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News, and I'm a great fan of Borussia Dortmund. Dortmund fans are super loyal. On all match days, the entire city is in black and yellow. It's like a religion. I think more than most German cities, uh, Soccer does play a very large role in the identity of Dortmund. In October of 2000, the uh, BBB became the first team in the Bundesliga to actually go public. Salaries for uh, soccer players in the Bundesliga have gone up very dramatically. With such high prices, they thought that by, um, by going public, they would be able to compete better with big teams like Bayern Munich. Unfortunately, that didn't go too well. Dortmund bought too many expensive players, high wages, and the club almost went bust in 2005. The, the price of their shares, uh, it has sometimes gone up, but mostly gone down since they made that decision. So on April 11th, 2017, the team was staying in a hotel on the outskirts of Dortmund. Match days are always special in Dortmund. Everyone is looking forward to it. The team always meets in the same hotel ahead of matches. They stayed in this hotel in order to have a kind of neutral space before games so that they could concentrate, be sort of isolated from distractions, things like that. Everyone was pretty optimistic. They had a chance to go really far, maybe into the finals. I was in the office and getting ready for match day. I was going to meet with a friend, a fellow Dortmund supporter in a pub. As always, the fans are very excited about matches. On that day, they were heading to play in the quarterfinal against AS Monaco at Signal Iduna Stadium, which is in the center of Dortmund. Shortly before 7 p.m., the players of the team boarded their official team bus. When the bus took off the parking lot of the hotel and turned on the street, there were three, three detonations, three bombs that exploded and hit the bus of Dortmund. Three explosions occurred close to the Borussia Dortmund team bus. The B-team bus had just left the hotel. The explosions destroyed two windows in the rear part of the bus. People screamed, people jumped to the ground. The fellow Dortmund fan I was supposed to watch the match with, uh, he called me and said, turn on, turn on the TV, there was an attack at the Dortmund bus. And I thought he was like, that was impossible. Some of the players uh, screamed at the driver to keep driving as fast as possible because they were worried that people might storm the bus. German investigators say the explosive devices used in the attack on the Borussia Dortmund bus contained metal pins, and that one had pierced a seat headrest. Unbeknownst to the team members, the actual mastermind behind the attack was, as they were disembarking the bus, was actually eating steak and sweet potatoes at the hotel they had just left. Authorities are attempting to verify a letter left at the scene claiming jihadists were behind the attack. 
because there had been a series of attacks by Islamic terrorists in Germany and Europe, there was a widespread suspicion in the media that this was another Islamic uh, terror attack. Three letters were found at the site of the bombing that took credit uh, for the attack on behalf of Islamic State. There were, however, reasons to, to, to doubt this particular narrative. It would actually be a surprise um, if ISIS um, were actually um, part of this, this attack. Possibly could be um, employed by other groups like the far right wing to try and shift the blame. The letters had some strange qualities. They were written in a strange uh, German that used big, sophisticated words, um, but had basic grammar mistakes, as if someone was a native German speaker but pretending to be a foreign person. Federal investigators have detained one man, suspected of links to Islamist terrorism, one of two suspects whose apartments were raided this morning. Shortly after the, the bombing, a, a, a man in Austria named Rudolf, who is a, was a big uh, BVB fan, he noticed that something strange was going on on the stock market related to the team's shares. He emailed the lawyers of BBB, who then forwarded that email on to investigators. The email stated that someone had bought 60,000 uh, BBB put options, a wager that the value of the shares of the team would fall below a certain amount at a certain date. Why would someone buy that ahead of a match and then three bombs go off, uh, something, something, something isn't right here. For the person to make money off of that, it required the stock to go down quite a bit in a fairly short period of time. And it wouldn't just be the team losing a match, it would require something much bigger than that. There was another big red flag about this purchase, which is the fact that it had actually been made, number one, on the day of the bombing, but also um, from an IP address that had been traced to the actual hotel where the bombing had taken place. When three explosions targeted the bus carrying the Borussia Dortmund footballers on April the 11th, written notes left at the scene claimed the attack was the work of ISIL. The truth, as is now alleged, is remarkable. On April 21st, the police arrested a man uh, in a southern German city called Tübingen. He was on his way to work, and his name was Sergei Benagold. He seemed like an unlikely suspect uh, because he had no known connections to the uh, Islamic uh, terror world. He didn't seem like a far-right extremist. He didn't seem like a left-wing extremist either. He seemed to be a completely unremarkable young man. A 28-year-old German-Russian man, named only as Sergei W., stayed in the same hotel as the players on the night before the bombing. He specifically requested an upper room overlooking the bushes where the explosive devices were hidden. The media dissected why he would do that, what was his past. He had uh, been inspired by the 2015 terror attack in Paris. And he noticed that in the aftermath of the attack, the stocks of French companies went down. And he believed that if an attack uh, took place that was directed at a specific company, that the decrease in stock price would, for that company would be even more dramatic. It never occurred to anyone that someone would do that out of greed. We now know that the suspect bought three different derivatives on the Borsia Dortmund shares. With all these derivatives, he bet on falling shares. The suspect bought the majority of these financial products on the 11th of April, the day of the attack. If the plot had been completely successful uh, and the stock had reached a value of zero, Bainergold would have made up to 570,000 euros, uh, or the equivalent of uh, about $608,000. Ultimately, the plan completely backfired. The attacker, Sergei Bainergold, didn't make any money. In fact, he lost money. In court, he would be extremely quiet. He usually kept his hands clasped together. One of the lawyers actually commented that he had never seen a defendant act so calmly. Wienergold had served some time in the German military. From that information and from online research, he was able to figure out how to assemble remote detonated bombs that would do um, what he hoped to do. 
there were a few days of extremely emotional testimony, including the soccer players who described doubting whether or not they could ever play another game again. It brought everything back up and it didn't quite help them to kind of process what was going on. Throughout it all, he sat there completely silent. The big mystery that was swirling around the trial was the question of why he may have simply done it because he wanted to impress a woman. Rebecca is a young woman who has a very troubled home life. She ultimately sees her relationship with Vaynergold as an opportunity to leave that troubled home. Vaynergold is a Russian immigrant to Germany. He speaks with an accent. He has anxiety in large groups of Germans. She begins to resent the fact that he has these fears and feels a little bit trapped. Rebecca attempts to dump him on multiple occasions, and he threatens to commit suicide if she leaves him. Vaynergold apparently uh, told Rebecca that she would soon be seeing a surprise. After being dumped uh, via text message, uh, he apparently began planning for this attack in earnest. Vaynergold was charged with 28 counts of attempted murder, which carried a maximum sentence in Germany of life in prison. He claimed that he had nothing to do with the attack, but as time went on, he admitted that he had actually been the person who had built the explosives and had set them off. Uh, but he claimed that he didn't want to actually kill anybody. Ultimately, Vaynergold didn't receive the harshest possible sentence. Uh, he was given 14 years in prison, but it's still a considerable amount in, in jail in Germany. The threat of an asteroid hitting Earth is very real. If it's big enough, it's also very final. These are very, very infrequent events. The probability is not zero, though. A blinding flash of light streaking across the sky. About 100 tons of space rock falls on Earth every day. Most of it is so small, it burns up in our atmosphere or lands unnoticed away from major populations. No human in the past thousand years is known to have been killed by a meteorite. And according to NASA, no large object is likely to strike the Earth any time in the next several hundred years. However, one thing is certain. We haven't found them all. There are thousands out there, and we don't know where they are. asteroids in our solar system. They number in the billions. Scientists all over the world are working toward detecting and deflecting the most catastrophic of natural disasters. The race is on to find as many of these objects as we can. We have a way of calculating whether or not an asteroid is potentially dangerous or not. I mean, I think it's something worth investing in. <laughs> it's our existence at stake, right? Amy, let's get this one out of the way. It's probably the question you get asked the most, but how scared should we be? Asteroids and comets are a natural hazard that's out there like a lot of other natural hazards. Uh, these are very, very infrequent events, these collision events where, where an object actually impacts the Earth. The most important thing that we need to know about asteroids is you know, when the next impact is going to happen and how bad it will be. What we know is that an object that's about say, a kilometer across, is capable of causing very, very wide devastation across the planet, really, truly global devastation. 
The object that wiped out the dinosaurs was somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10 kilometers across, so even bigger than that. At a kilometer, it's still gonna be very uh, bad and it will have global effects. For objects that are capable of causing what I would call sort of regional damage, kind of a large major metropolitan area, a city and its surrounding environments, sort of around 100-ish meters. It depends on the details of the composition and so forth. By the 1980s, NASA was cataloging near-Earth objects. In 1994, stargazers watched as comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit Jupiter. The resulting zone of chaos was estimated to be as large as the Earth, and the event became a turning point in the search for asteroids and comets in our solar system. In 1998, Congress tasked NASA with finding 90% of asteroids and comets one kilometer wide or larger. Soon after, Hollywood blockbusters Armageddon and Deep Impact brought attention and fear to the masses. The great news is that the vast majority, more than 90% of all the really large one kilometer near Earth objects have been found. The challenge now is working down to these smaller sizes that are still quite capable